Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, this is the Pearl Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees meeting, June 13th, 2018. Um, we will be going into closed session. Uh, are there any speakers to any closed session items? Okay. So seeing none, uh, we will um, we will be discussing closed session items, um, expulsion referrals, certificated public employee appointment, employment, and classified public employee appointment and employment, uh, public employee discipline, dismissal, release, and leaves, negotiations, updates, real property, and that's it. And we will be back at 7. Thank you. Okay, we've got four board members seated, so we can go ahead and open. Um, welcome to the Paro Valley Unified School District board meeting uh, for June 13th, 2018. Thank you for your patience, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and Vice President Orozco has um, said that she will lead us. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. So I just want to say welcome to everybody. We wrapped up another school year. And um, as uh, everybody worked really, really hard to get our students through and onto the next grade or onto their um, work life or college life, um, it was a busy, crazy week last week, but it was wonderful. I'm sure we all got to um, participate in some graduations. And um, it was just as great as always. So that was, I, I just, that's our favorite thing, right? Is um, having students come here and show us what they're learning and then seeing what those final results are, are always really special for us. Um, so I will go ahead and move to item 3.3 and that's superintendent comments. Dr. Yeah. Rodriguez. So as Mrs. DeRose said, um, we, have had, we had a great last three weeks in PVUSD. Um, we were able to graduate over 960 graduates last week. Las últimas tres semanas en el distrito han sido excelentes. Um, pudimos graduar a más de 960 estudiantes la semana pasada. And so I was able to have um, my last day in the life of this year. So you can see pictures on the screen um, with elementary librarian at Starlight Elementary, um, Danae um, Calvio. And it was wonderful to see the connection that she has with the students as they visitor, visited her before and during school. Um, she knew every single student by name. And Danae really is um, not only building their passion for reading, but also is a source of comfort and to support um, to so many students. So, pude tener mi último día de la, de la vida de este año con una, um, una persona que trabaja en la biblioteca primaria en la escuela Starlight, Danae Calvio. Y fue maravilloso ver la conexión que tiene con los estudiantes cuan, cuando la visitaron antes y durante la escuela. Ella conocía a cada uno um, de los estudiantes por nombre y Dene no solo le está um, edificando su pasión por la lectura, sino que también es un fuente de consuelo y apoyo, apoyo para muchos estudiantes. And so I was able to send out my end of year message to all staff. Um, and it's atta attached to the email was um, this data sheet that you now see here. And we're really proud of the growth that we have made and look forward to continuing to expand our initiatives to have a greater impact in our students. So también um, pude enviar mi mensaje de fin del año a todo el personal. 
Uh, junto al correo electrónico, incluimos esta, esta hoja de resultados. Estamos muy orgullosos del crecimiento que hemos logrado y esperamos continuar expandiendo nuestras iniciativas para tener un impacto aún mayor para nuestros estudiantes. So I just want to draw your attention to this a little bit. I know you guys received this on Friday. Um, but it really is, is quite um, amazing. So um, teachers, staff have been working on many, many new initiatives. Um, these are growth percentiles. So this is where we were ranked last year on the exact same. Um, this is comparing us to um, 10.2 million students. So it's not just a little bitty group of students, but it is um, our 10,000 students to 10 million students. So um, you can see the the difference, but um, you'll see we just put some um, grade levels, but you'll see that um, we went from very low in general. So for instance, let's take second grade, we were at the 10 percentile of growth. That means that we basically only be out and growing more in a school year than 9% of the schools. This year, it was 68 percentile. So meaning that we beat out 67% of the schools nationwide in growth in our students. Um, you can see that we did equal growth in math and reading. Um, and so we're, we're really proud of that. Also, when you look at students meeting their goals, so you kind of go down um, where it says with a big dot, um, goals met, you'll see that we increased um, the number of students meeting one year's progress. We increased it by 33% over last year in math and 39% and, um, in reading. Um, so we're talking about, uh, over a thousand students, right? That we did much better job with them. So we went in math from 4278 to this year 5,669 students in the area of math. And in reading, we went from 3,941 to 5,462. And that is out of um, the 10,674 students that took the assessment. So it's every student in grades um, second to 10th grade. Then as you know, we did early literacy growth with the pilot. Um, and so these are for our first grade students. And so um, last year when we looked at, now this is not cohort data. So this is last year's first graders and then this year's first graders. Um, but they both came in comparatively low. Um, and so this year, last year, only 74% of our students um, reached the, the level of, of decoding. And this year it's 94%. Um, and these are our three SIP schools that we talk about that's going to be expanded um, six more next year. So a total of nine will have the program next year. This year it's just three. So we have additional information that will be released in the next um, several weeks. Um, and so look for more detailed information. We wanted to make sure and get this out to staff with my end of year just to really um, just help um, you know, substantiate and validate all the work that they've done over the year. So we are proud of um, what we're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. It was definitely a collective effort. <laughs> so thank you very much. And thanks to all the site staff and, and teachers for making that happen. Um, okay, board comments is next. Um, have you got comments, Karen? I can start with you. and. Okay. okay, your mic, you need to have your mic on. Your mic. Okay. Is there a place to turn it on? It is already on for you. <laughs> it's on this side. <laughs> it's easy on this side. <laughs> yeah, so um, I went to a lot of graduations, and a actually after a graduation, I actually went to uh, the Migrant Head Start meeting after a graduation. <laughs> So I went to the adult education graduation with others. And I went to graduations that are one after the other. I went to the new school and then Renaissance graduation. I went to the Alianza graduation. And then after, I, after that, I went to the Migrant Head Start meeting. And I went to Pajaro Middle School graduation. And I actually went to a fifth grade promotion that looked like one of those 
those pictures that you showed on your your picture was it fit? That, no, that was starlight. Oh, it looked like Ohlone because <laughs> it looked like a school Ohlone, and it was a really a wonderful promotion. It was really great outside. It was really great, but I had to leave a little early to go to the special education graduation. Um, so that was really cool too. Thanks, Maria. Um, no comments. Kim. Hi. Thank you. Um, as most people know, this is um, a beautiful time of year when um, we as board members get to go to graduations and see so many happy faces, happy families. Um, it makes us proud to be part of the district. and Lots um, of balloons. Lots of <laughs> balloons, lots of air horns. Um, so uh, like everybody else, I was at uh, the adult school graduation, which was very um, special and poignant because there's a group of um, students there that have a lot stacked against them. And it was just really gratifying to see them um, walking up um, very proud and um, receiving their GEDs, receiving their um, high school graduation certificates, and in some cases receiving um, vocational certifications that were very special. So I want to thank Nancy Bilicich. It was a beautiful um, graduation as usual. Um, I also attended um, many um, high school graduations, including Aptos High, where we had two students that were specially recognized um, they had lost their uh, fathers as children, um, one in the CHP and one in the fire in firefighting. And um, there was a, a lot of troopers came from the CHP. I think 12 of them came to give one of the diplomas to a young woman who lost her dad when she was two, and she didn't know this was going to happen. So that was a very moving uh, presentation. They awarded her her diploma. Um, and same with a, another student for firefighters. Um, the firefighting captain, I think, was there and um, presented the diploma to her, and that was very special. I'd like to also point out that there were many, many students in the crowd that also had lost parents, some, some of them um, very, very recently. And so um, we don't want uh, um, some students' uh, recognition to diminish the loss that's there. Um, we also... Um, I also attended... Um, junior high graduation and uh, several sixth grade promotions that were very darling. And in particular, Mar Vista, um, the entire school is there um, lined up from TK to K and, and on down the line. And um, so it was just really special to um, be there. And um, the district did honor uh, Mr. Detterman, the principal there, for his 37 years of service. So again, I'd like to congratulate him and wish him a very well-deserved retirement. Thank you. Trustee Yarrow. Uh, thank you. Um, I was able to get to six uh, graduations, and they were and and it just kind of reminds us why we're up here, and it's and it's a, a very rewarding afternoon that uh, we can see the youngsters. And I've been on on the board long enough where these kids actually began when they were kindergartners so I so I felt really um, good about that I felt very old at, old at the same time <laughs> thinking this happened and 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 a um, thing that I noticed most of the valedictorians and um, and uh, those that were in the uh, upper grade levels happened to be uh, females and if, right. and if you <laughs> notice that, you know that we're going to have to change what we're doing a little bit to balance it out, don't you think? I, uh, thank you. That's all Stop I have. Time. Those are my <laughs> observations. <laughs> Trustee Acosta? No comment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. I just clicked off of it. Okay. Item 4.0 is approval of tonight's agenda. I'd like to move approval of the agenda. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes 601. Um, number five, item five is approval of the minutes from the May 23rd, <coughs> 2018. Moving um, approval. Meeting, and I will be abstaining because I wasn't here. Um, I will second that motion with one modification under item 3.2. I'm not the current board president. 
Uh, so we should change that to vice president. Um, so you want to amend your motion, Kim? Sure, I'll amend the motion to reflect that change. Okay. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, Staying. But at one, okay. So four, zero, one, 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 one two. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't think it could get more complicated. <laughs> it doesn't seem complicated, but it is when you're up here. Um, okay, item, that was 4.1, five approval of minutes we just got done. Six is a public hearing on local control accountability plan. So I'm going to close the regular meeting and open item six, public hearing. And we have, is this Susan? Perez. Thank you, Susan. Is this on? Yes, I guess it is. Yes. Good evening, um, President uh, DeRose, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, it is that time of year again. And um, I am here to share with you um, the draft of our LCAP. I do want to let you know that there are a couple of changes this year from what we've done in the past. Um, this is our fourth um, writing, our, our fourth LCAP we're bringing forward. The first three years, we brought forward an LCAP that needed to have, um, there was an expectation that it was going to be rewritten each year with, with substantial revisions. A year dropped off, a new year was added. It was kind of a, um, it was a, it was not a static document. Last year, they, the state changed that, and the plan that we submitted last year was a three-year static document. Where, while we can make revisions based on data and, and stakeholder input if you choose to, there is not an expectation that that plan changes until the end of three years. So we have completed the first of a three-year plan, and what I'll be sharing with you this evening is really a recap of what we know of our, our results so far, where we're recommending based on those results that we may want to expand or revise, and then um, we'll be bringing that back based on your input um, for approval at the next meeting. Um, there is another change, but I'll explain that as I get a little bit further in. So as a reminder, I know you've heard this before, um, our LCAP has seven goals, same seven goals that it had last year. Um, we have divided those up or grouped them into three major areas or what we call the three buckets, 21st century learning, high quality learning environments, and connectedness, which is really our um, school climate goal. Um, I brought the update on our stakeholder input process to you in February, but just to recap that, Although it is a three-year plan, we are still required to go through a process every year of reviewing it, gathering stakeholder input, and making sure that you're aware of that. So we did go through the process starting in March of holding parent sessions um, for parents at all of our school sites. We also, although it's not up here, did maintain um, and still have um, a site on our website where parents can complete a survey if they were not able to make it to a session. We had sessions for students at all of our school sites. Um, we sent survey out to all teachers. We met with both DLAC and our district advisory committee twice. We held a session for community groups and we um, received written input from PVFT. So a lot of stakeholder input. Um, we this evening are having the public hearing. So these are the next steps now between now and, and submission to the county. Final board approval will be on the 28th and the LCAP is due to the County Office of Education by June 30th. Just so you are aware of the um, process. Um, based on all that, the stakeholder input was remarkably similar to what I received last year. So the top priorities across all the stakeholder groups really were these top four. Facilities improvement is still number one priority. Um, improving academic achievement, continuing to build out our visual and performing arts programs, um, emphasis on music, 
um, from what I heard this year, and then continuing to improve school climate. So um, what I do want to share with you, and this is where something has changed a little bit, um, is uh, an update on what our outcomes were this year and then what our next steps are that we're recommending for our actions for next year. We found out this year from the county and apparently many districts across the state that we had not been doing the LCAP in the way that the state had um, envisioned that we would be doing this and we were asked to change one part of it. There are for each goal actions and then expected outcomes. And because at the end of a school year when the LCAP is due, we didn't necessarily know um, the, all of our outcomes. For example, we didn't know what our graduate, we wouldn't know now what our graduation rates are for this year. We were reporting on prior year, the most current that we did have, and the state said, no, we don't want prior year, we only want to know how you did this year. So what we are being required to do is in any outcome where we do not have data yet, we needed to, sub to write in data pending. And they have added a second submission. So as soon as we have that data in September, I am required to fill that in and bring the LCAP back to you for a second time so that you can look at the LCAP again once all of 17, 18 data it can be included. So that is the process. So this is, um, your, it's coming to you for approval, but the LCAP will come back to you in the fall with an update on the, all the data that we don't have now. So as I go through these, you are going to see several areas where I'm going to have to tell you we don't know the outcome yet, the, the data is pending. So on our first goal, which is the um, improving student achievement and making sure all our students are college and career ready, we have three measures. Um, the CASP, our um, A to G growth, and our growth in our NWEA map. Well, we don't have our CASP scores yet, and we don't know our um, a to G completion for this year. We do know that we grew on MAP, and um, I think you saw this chart a moment ago, but to drive the point home, um, we, were, we had definitely our reporting growth on MAP. Um, now, you need to know this year was baseline, so our target had been five percentage, point growth, five percentage points growth per year. Um, we grew 56% this year on both language or both reading and math, which is phenomenal. And so we are um, convinced, you know, very hopeful that we'll continue that growth. But it really is baseline because this is only our second year with MAP. Um, so fall, you will find out our other two targets here. But based on what we do know on our data, um, which is also our lit early literacy scores as well as MAP, we do um, intend to expand that SIPS reboot that we piloted this year at three schools to six more schools next year and then out to more schools the following year. Definitely positive results from that. Um, we are going to be piloting for adoption our elementary language arts curriculum for next year and also secondary history social science. Um, as you recall, with um, the adoption of Common Core, we needed to slowly roll out all new content area curriculum for all new content areas, but we have to wait until the state has a framework and publishers have materials. So we're now at the point where we can go ahead and do these next two rounds of pilots and adoptions. Um, we are based on success last summer and during the year with some math interventions that we piloted, going to expand our math interventions um, this next year. Uh, we are not only having a pre-math for incoming ninth graders this year in summer school, which will be our sex year, second year, we are also adding a sixth grade intervention math program that will be for um, upcoming sixth graders. So excited about that. And then as we continue to try to ensure that we are meeting the needs of all students and differentiating as much as possible, we are... Um, recommending that we purchase more digital programs for intervention. Um, what are some examples of digital programs? We use Lexia, which is a reading program at elementary, and we would like to expand to Achieve 3000, which is a reading program at secondary. We're using a program called ST Math at elementary. We also use a math intervention program called Manga High. Um, 
There is a program that we have been piloting this year at middle school for reading called Reading Plus. We're looking at, we use that at one middle school. We want to expand that to a second middle school. There is a program called Alex um, that we've been using at middle school with a great deal of success. So those are just to mention a few. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, our second goal was um, establishing CTE pathways. Our target was to have one state-approved pathway in place this year at all three high schools. We surpassed that goal, definitely met it. Um, we want to, moving forward, continue to build those pathways. Um, we are going to transition a CTE counselor um, from the County Office of Ed to our district, so that's <laughs> it's cost neutral, pr pretty close to that. But rather than being a county employee, they will be ours. Um, we are recommending a part-time CTE coach for one year only. We're starting a new um, computer science pathway that will be leading up through the schools to Aptos High and to PV High. And we want to have this coach for the first year to really make sure that's a solid pathway and in place. And then the following year, that, that position will not continue. Um, and again, for CTE, um, we're recommending additional professional development specific to these programs and digital programs that are specific to um, CTE that, that can be used in these classrooms as well. Our third goal is our um, visual and performing arts goal. We met and surpassed that goal. Um, we are recommending some expansions for next year. Um, El Sistema music program, very successful at Radcliffe. We want to expand to Minty White. And we want to expand the Latino Film Institute's Youth Cinema Project, which is at Starlight and Cesar Chavez in one grade level, expand it up to the next grade level so that students can continue to participate in that. And then um, in our original VAPA plan, which is now goal three of the LCAP, we did not have instrumental starting at the high school level until 1920. But because we were successful in getting instrumental programs going at middle school, we have eighth graders who want to continue on. And um, so we are recommending moving the instrumental up and adding it at the ninth grade level or for high school for next year. And so we will at PV High have band and at Aptos High a drum line, which is exciting. Sorry, yes. you know we've been wanting this. So. Yes. <laughs> Um, so those are the expansions for um, the goal three. Fourth goal is um, our basics. It's the Williams requirements. So it is the working um, environments, credential teachers, and instructional materials met this goal. We're going to continue all the actions for this goal. We did find that there was one action that we had actually not completed this year. Um, one of the actions we put in in 1718 was to hire two custodial supervisors, one to supervise day custodians and one to supervise night custodians. We were not, did not fill the night supervisor position, so we were really pushing to get that filled right away. Um, otherwise, all the other actions will continue for this goal. Um, and this is an area where I definitely heard from stakeholders, as I mentioned, um, we're seeing the change keep it going. Um, really wanting us to continue this. Um, this is our goal um, to improve our outcomes for our English learners. We did meet our reclassification target. We did not re meet our target for reducing um, the percentage of long-term English learners. And so we definitely want to continue updating our master plan. The master plan is looking at research and successful practices around the state to specifically address long-term English learners. So in addition to the update, we'll be moving to implementation. We are going to be expanding our dual immersion program at Freedom, which started in kindergarten to first grade this next year. And then we are also piloting a new curriculum at the middle school level for English language development. And this is, again, an area where for our long-term English learners, um, we need, we really need to, to strengthen middle school. Um, goal six is promoting a safe, supportive school environment. This is our school climate goal. Our targets here, we have, we have no data yet because this looks at graduation rates, dropout rates, attendance rates, expulsion rates, suspension rates. That's all information that we don't have yet for this year. We'll re be reporting that in the fall. This is one where I heard from stakeholders over and over again, this is working 
we love the socio-emotional counselors, keep this going, and so we're continuing all the actions. Our actions for this goal really um, center around our socio-emotional socio counselors, um, continuing to implement PBIS, our positive behavioral intervention supports, um, building out uh, what's called an MTSS framework, a multi-tiered system of support where we're really taking a more holistic view um, at providing programs for our students that address both academics and behavioral, the social emotional um, portion of their education, and then um, building out sports, providing opportunities for students. Our last goal is increasing our parent participation. We met most of our targets, and we are going to continue all our actions for this goal, but we actually are recommending um, and hoping to establish a baseline for a new target for next year. Um, previously, we had been basically counting up numbers of parents who showed up for different um, events, and we did not really feel like that was an effective measure, and so what we want to do is gather some base-like information and have a target definitely keep monitoring are we having parents attending, but are we having a variety of parent events and, and get more at the quality of what we're providing for parents. So we're recommending modifying that. Um, those are our seven goals. Those are our recommendations for next year, and I'm happy to address any questions. Do we have any speakers to this item? Not. Okay. Um, so then we'll move to 6.3 um, comments from the board or questions. Yeah. And then Willie. Thank you, Susan. <coughs> um, I looked through the report, and as usual, it's a tremendous amount of work. So it, what, is what I'm looking at was developed last year with some um, modifications, right? I would love to tell you very few modifications, <laughs> but although it was a three-year static plan, the state still <laughs> changed multiple sections, that, so we did have to do quite a bit of, of work on it. But um, in terms of the actual actions and goals and targets, those stayed that was the static part of it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with music because that's what I have championed for many years, trying to bring it back to the district. So well, I'm disappointed to hear that we're only having band at PV High. Can you talk about that more? Because I was um, hoping we would have band at all three comprehensive high schools. The, the only reason we are not having this at Watsonville High School is because the academy structure um, did not allow for students to be able to take band this next year. And so it was a limitation in the scheduling at the school. Um, I, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, I'm not sure about why the drum line was selected at Aptos High School as opposed to a regular band. I'd have to check on that answer. Yeah, my understanding is they were going to have both, so it probably came down to course selection. So when students, you know, students have the ability to sign up for courses, so what must have happened is they there was a large group of students that wanted um, drumline but did not um, request band. Because so there because is a that, there is a band program in place at Aptos Junior, so there's a yes, there whole is. cohort of children that have learned instruments that could go into a band program so I guess I'm disappointed that we we don't have that I mean drum, I get I mean drumline sounds very sexy it sounds really exciting but a, but I mean you can have an entire percussion drumline within the in the confines mm -hmm. of a band program well, so, um, oops, yeah. I'm sorry so let us double check on that because okay. when I talked to Sue Gralty she told me that there was band um, at both of the high schools, the, we were, I knew there was not band at Watsonville High, and the reasoning was the issue with the academies. Um, so, so okay, let's, let's Which, double check. I will definitely double check Actos High. I guess I do understand the issue with the academies. Maybe we don't have enough space to, because I know a band room is an, you know, it's a lot of space and there's storage and everything. But it just feels like an equity issue. Like music is a pathway. And um, I feel like we need to offer that at Watsonville as well. I don't believe it was an issue of space. It was scheduling, um, students fitting it in their schedules. Um, but I'll definitely make note of that. I don't know how the other board members feel, but I feel like all our kids need to have access to that. Um, 
Well, I'll stop there, but I'll probably have a couple more comments, actually. Is that okay, Leslie? Of course. I'm going to gather some more thoughts about other areas. Thanks. Sure. Willie? Yes. Uh. Yes. Um, uh, Susan, if 87% uh, of our general fund money goes to salaries and benefits, now we're faced with 13% um, of the general fund paying for everything that's in this report. What if revenues drop? What if um, attendance goes, uh, drops down? Revenues um, decrease? Uh, is the state going to say, hey, listen, what, what, uh, where's your uh, report? And second, we've, we've all gone through budget cuts every year. And is, is that, um, have uh, you come up with a list of priorities that you want first to meet off out of, out of this report? So if I can, if I can speak sure. to that. So one thing that I would say is when you look at actually what's within the report, a lot of that is personnel. <laughs> so a lot, whether it's the VAPA teachers or it's the coaches that we were referring to or the social emotional counselors, those are our teachers, which is within that, that amount of the 87%, which is now um, a little higher than that. Um, so one thing I would say that too, um, and we're going to have the budget report in a little bit, but our indications are that the ongoing funding is going to continue to increase. Um, and so one thing I think that is different than before is the fact that the, there is the rainy day fund for the state of California that was not present prior. Um, and so um, I would say that um, many, of course, everything that we have in here, we consider to be priority. That's why we're spending our monies on it. Um, and um, if we did have to reduce, um, it would mean reducing of staff. Um, I will say that what just is coming out of committee, and I don't want to ruin his, his whole show, but what's coming out of committee, if it gets signed by the, by the governor, which we assume it will be signed by the governor, will actually receive over two million of additional ongoing monies each year. That's not even in the budget that we are proposing tonight because it's not been approved yet. Um, so I don't foresee us having to do that. But when you look at actually what the expenses are in the LCAP, grand majority of it is actually staff. Um, very little of it is stuff, so to speak, um, that it would be considered the other 13%. Okay. So um, um, taking, the, taking the plan and moving to the actual action to implement the plan, on the ETC, on CTE, I keep, every year I get those back. <laughs> on the CTE, are we ever going to see the plan itself and what we're, what we're going to implement and how it's going to get done and when? Within the LCAP, under each goal is the plan for implementation. Um, CTE goal is goal number two in the LCAP, and the actions to implement those um, pathways are and, in but, there. So, so is the board going to be able to input or see uh, what the actual plan is and and who's going to do it? And we have a we have a CTE coordinator that I haven't. Other than the first time he came, I haven't seen him since. Yeah. So, so we've had Rob here twice. We we have we did have it slated um, for May um, because our board meetings have been fairly long. Um, we haven't had him back, but we can definitely bring him back. Um, we. Um, we not only are, are doing really well in the CT realm, but we also started a countywide initiative around science and NGSS um, that just started this past, um, this past week. Um, so we can definitely re-put that on there um, because we not only have now tr true pathways, which are state, um, state 
approved, so to speak, or state recognized, I guess would be a better word. Um, but we surpassed that. We wanted to have at least one, and we have more than one um, in the places. So we can do that. Um, we just have to choose which date that we want to put it on the board item. Well, yeah, uh, thank you. My, my uh, concern is that we have, we have all these agencies trying to do stuff. We have, we have, we have adult ed. We have the, we have the schools. We have ROP, we have uh, Perkins money, and I have yet to see a coordinated program that is producing kids coming out of high school ready for some uh, career. And so that's what I want to see. What I want to see is uh, the coordination of all these agencies that are helping us putting together a, a uh, plan that works. So if I can just say one thing about what Willie said. Some of the um, additional money that's not in the budget that if the governor signs, which everyone is expecting him to sign, is um, strong workforce money for K-12. And attached to that, at least at the community college level, um, uh, it, we will be mandated that we show um, positive outcomes with students. It's a strong workforce, so it's workforce ready um, is attached to it. So that would be a big piece of that. So Susan, you mentioned that uh, we exceeded the number of CTA pathways. What was uh, the initial goal? One pathway per high school that was state recognized. We did not have one that we had met all the criteria to be state recognized. And I don't, because I'm standing up here, I don't have the LCAP in front of me, but I want to say we ended up with four at Watsonville and two at each of the other schools. So we definitely surpassed the goal. Then that's really a lot to do with the hard work of Rob really organizing and pulling things together and working with all the sites and making sure that. Uh, we did get those pathways recognized. Thank you. And then, um, so I noticed as far as um, um, asking for feedback, we surveyed um, PBFT, the teachers. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why we haven't provided the same or a similar survey to classified employees? Um, I could certainly do that. I reached out to CSEA's leadership and did not get any kind of response. I reached out several times. Um, trying to get a time to meet with them and get some input and, and talk about ways to gather um, feedback and, and just didn't get any response. So, so this year is due to Letty's um, going off on medical leave. So we did, we do now have Esther that is supporting, but for many months we didn't have um, a president um, for CSEA. So um, I think a lot of it was due to um, Letty's illness and being out on medical leave. So we'll make sure and, and do that next year. Thank you. Um, and then those four CET. Uh, pathways that are state recognized. I'm assuming they meet the A through G requirements. Yes. Oh. Um, yes, actually, they meet multiple requirements. So they meet the hours, um, the course sequencing. So they have to have at least two or more courses, 300 hours. They have to either end in an internship, a certification, or job shadowing, or dual enrollment. Um, and so they meet all the different criteria as well as being A through G approved. Thank you. And then just to piggy up, piggyback on Kim's comments regarding BAPA and having a band at Watsonville High, um, I think we really need to um, start looking at the academies, uh, the academies um, and see if they're actually effective, one, and then two, um, whether they're a 3G. And if they're not, I think maybe we, we should try in looking at um, getting rid of the ones that are just not effective and possibly... Um, moving into um, offering BAPA at uh, Watsonville High School. <clears throat> and then my last um, question for you, Susan, is who's going to be involved in updating the master plan for English language learners? Um, at this point in time, our director of equity, um, state and federal programs and accountability has been um, leading that, working with a group of stakeholders and um, an outside consultant and 
the new person being hired will take that over and continue that next fall. And do we know who those stakeholders are? Um, I'm sure we can get the list, yes. That'll be good. Sure. Information to have, thank you. Mm -hmm. I was to say, in general, we have um, teachers, admin, um, parents have been invited, um, district staff, and I'm trying to remember if any classified classified invited. Yeah, so those are the, f the folks that were there. Um, and then we do have a, a list that meet, that they come together and that they meet, and it's represented um, elementary, middle, and high school. One of my suggestions to that, something to consider is maybe including CAVE as part of? Um, Ca uh, the, the local um, chapter, Lucia Vida Real, is also involved. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Acosta, do you have any comments or questions? Not at this time. Did, go ahead. I'm sorry. I did not look this way. Go ahead, Karen. And then I think Kim had some. Yeah, some thoughts. Um, well, it's a couple of things. Um, so, because uh, we're talking about CTE, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, we can look at um, not only the things that Michelle mentioned, but we can look at things like apprenticeships and things like that for CTE you know, people going through the CT, if there's any kind of pr apprenticeship program that they can be involved in, that would be cool. Um, the other thing is, um, I'm hoping that we really work on the PBS in all the schools. Um, I went to a meeting at Freedom with um, a 10-year-old who was suspended for one day, and there was, your parents were very upset. Anyways, um, and in that meeting, they said that they they really weren't completely on board with the PBIS yet, that they had started with it or something, but they weren't completely on, they weren't, you know, it was, was not, they were not completely on board with the PBIS in their school. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm hoping that PBIS is in every single school and every single school is, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, so every school um, team has been trained. The implementation level are vary across the district. So depending on the school site and the school team in terms of implementation is different, but every school site has been trained. Within our new MTSS framework, it is um, one of our first priorities that we will be tackling to so the schools that are slower in their implementation to give them the support that it is fully implemented at all schools. And our goal is by the end of next year that all of yeah, our schools. Absolutely, that would be great. Um, and then the last thing of the music thing, you know, I, I really love the music idea too. I mean, I mean, I, I grew up in, a, in you know, high schools that had, you know, bands, all the high school had bands. And I, I mean, I was a cheerleader and flag twirler and I marched with the band. You know, we had, we were in the halftime and I was in the halftime with the band, you know, doing my thing. <laughs> and my sisters were in the band they played it they played clarinet and the bassoon and flute they were in and my my sister went from being in the band the whole time she was in high school to actually being in the band when she was in college at UCSB she actually she went and was in the band and, and so that's how that's how wonderful it was for her that she continued in band after high school so I'm hoping we can have bands <laughs> that's what I want in all the high schools, because that's the kind of high school that I was able to go to. Of course, I like that. All right, thanks. Karen. Kim. Thank you. Um, so I didn't say this earlier in my remarks, but I, I am very pleased about our academic achievement. I think um, we have a lot to be proud of, and I just want to um, say thank you to Michelle Rodriguez for bringing a lot of interesting and innovative programs I feel like that are driving us forward. The SIPS reboot, um, I think, it is an example. And I know we're going to be expanding it to six more schools. I'm wondering if, um, I mean, I know we, we probably shouldn't bite off more than that at a time. But it, it, could, we, could we actually expand to more schools at one time? So we, we had that conversation. We were able to expand to six just because now our coaches are trained. Um, 
we do a really intensive, the reason why it's having the impact it is, is because it's so, such intensive training. So it's intensive training, not only for the teachers and support for modeling and, and planning, but it's also support for the site administrator. Um, and so it takes a lot of focus. I know it feels slow, but what the six will allow us is to do the last, um, the last seven um, the following year. So not this coming school year, but the next, we will have everybody on board. And I'm a really big advocate of if you're going to do it, do it well. And um, so we go, we're going as fast as we can, impacting things as fast as we can. Um, and because we're going, um, making sure that that's our mantra, that we're going to do it well, then um, sometimes it takes us a little bit longer, but it allows us to have the results. Okay, thank you. And um, so I thank you for the leadership. But again, I think all of us feel like, you know, the real work is taking place on the campuses. So Susan Perez, thank you. Thank you for to your staff. Thank you to site administration and for the teachers who are in the classrooms, helping us to move this achievement gap forward. This is um, one of our biggest goals as our board is to help these kids um, be more successful in their lives. So this is a step in the right direction. So thank you. Um, I am uh, wondering about, I was just reading the part in climate. So I, I get that we, maybe we don't have data in this area to report in, but we do have a number of kids that receive services from PVPSA, which seems like we could easily put our finger on that data. We have kids, you know, on every campus in kids' corner counseling. We have, I mean, couldn't, isn't that sort of? We, we have anecdotal data that the work we're doing is effective. What we don't have are for the specific targets that we put into the LCAP um, as our measurable outcomes of those particular targets I'm not able to report whether we met those or how effectively we met those targets. In terms of other measures of that particular goal, I think I, I can safely and with confidence say, yes, we're, make, we're definitely making progress in that goal. And I think, there are, um, I think there's still work to be done there. Um, we have great needs in that area, but the, the actions we've taken have been very effective. Um, <clears throat> Along the same lines, um, I'm very pleased that we are um, able to put athletic directors back in place at the junior highs, provide coaching stipends at the junior high level. That, that, that had all gone away, so that feels like an improvement. We still have a problem, though, because we have coaching. Um, we have coaches that are not employed by the district who put in hours and hours and hours of their time with our young people and are not receiving any pay for those for that. Um, for that coaching. And as, um, as we know, athletics are a main um, shaping factor in many, um, in many students' lives. And so I feel like that's an area that we could improve somehow okay. so that people aren't volunteering their time and expertise. Okay. I I'll bring be that getting us to the cabinet. Um, I think, too, if we um, – the coaches give so much of, their, of themselves every day um, to their students that I, I do feel like um, as a district we could do a better job of providing them some professional development or s something. So I don't know if that's something we can think about adding to the LCAP. Kind of their unsung heroes, really. <clears throat> okay. E yeah, I think that's it for now. Thanks. Okay. Okay, um, so so I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, yes, I want I would like to see band in all the high schools. I think you know that we've been um, hoping for that and working towards that for a long time. Um, a question: So if if we do see a funding reduction, which I know the outlook looks like that's not going to be happening um, in the near future, but if we did and we had to make cuts, we still have to go to the parents in the community for recommendations through the LCAP process, correct? Yeah, so if VAPA is a priority now, hopefully it would be then too. So that's the one thing that I, I think is the best thing about the local accountability plan. 
is that we get to craft what we're doing for students with student parent community input. It's really a blueprint of what the community wants. So if the community wants VAPA now, they'll support it when, you know, when times are tough, hopefully. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's really a strength that we get with that LCAP. Um, with the VAPA teachers, are we hiring all credentialed VAPA teachers? Yes. They're all credentialed? Yes. Okay. Um, I thought we did a st student and parent survey every year, either through um, PVPSA or the school district. Is that not data that we can use? It isn't every year. It's not. Oh, that's no. right. It's every other. Yes. Okay. So, um, if we did it every year, is that is that data that we could use in our LCAP? Mm -hmm. Do you want to address that? Yes, it is. And <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a meeting next week. We talked about it at Cabinet of possibly doing something that's called Youth Survey um, that we could um, do every year that really builds on asking questions about climate, not only of our students, but it has a teacher component. So that was something that um, was brought and um, not requested, but it was a conversation, and right now I, I can't remember which one of the three of you ladies it came from, but asking about um, how do we get consistent, consistent feedback from our teachers and our staff, um, and so we're going to be, although it's the label is called Youth Survey. It actually has a teacher component as well. Um, and that would allow us on a yearly basis to be able to see how we're doing and is the climate and people feeling valued and appreciated and safe and, and secure. Is that increasing every year or how is it moving forward? Um, it also allows us to do um, cater questions um, that um, we might not be able to do in other situations. So we are looking into that. It's fairly inexpensive. Um, it's about $10,000 for the entire district. We're trying to get him down from there. Mm -hmm. But um, so we're having a demo of that next week during cabinet. Okay, thank you. Leslie, yes. just to follow up to that, will that <coughs> survey also include a parent component? So we can, it has all three components. If we wanted to, we definitely could do the parent component as well, and it's in English and Spanish, of course. Um, so we could do all three. Um, it's not really, it's only a couple hundred dollars more to do um, the second set. Really, once you do one subgroup, the rest aren't, aren't very expensive. So we could do that. Great, thank I you. I have one, one last thank thing. You. Okay. Um, I didn't see anywhere in this LCAP, and maybe this isn't the right place for it, but I was hoping that we could provide some SAT or ACT study sessions on Super Saturdays for our students so that they could get better. I test believe it is in there in goal one. Oh, it is. I'm oh, pretty oh, good. I'm That's pretty great. sure it is in there. Okay. Thank you. It Thank might you. not be spelled out specifically as that, but there are study sessions for students on Super Saturdays, and that is one of the types of sessions that we do provide. Okay. And are there any other board comments or questions on this item? Okay. If not, um, I will go ahead and I'll close this public hearing and um, open a, a new public hearing on budget adoption and this is item 7.1. And I believe we have Mr. Dominguez here to present this item. All right, good evening, President DeRose, members of the board, Superintendent Rodriguez. Uh, so this evening we're going over the proposed uh, budget for 1819 and then uh, reviewing 1718 uh, estimated actuals. Um, the, uh, we will go over uh, those two components um, the assumptions that are built within that are multi-year projections and then cover next steps. And how we build the assumptions and the budget development process is um, making sure that we use the current information given at that point in time. 
And so this is uh, considering the governor's May revise. And then on the revenue, uh, the LCFF um, on the governor's July budget uh, proposal. Um, it also takes into consideration our average daily attendance. Um, and there is a chart on the PowerPoint that you'll see that we're at 17,282 uh, for the current year and the outgoing year. But I'll also touch on that as what is the game plan moving forward. Um, also uh, in the revenue side is our student enrollment and number of days in instruction. And uh, Helen will cover the items that are in the expense side. So on the expense side, we have the employee step and column, which is, oh, you get sorry, closer. thank you. Um, we cover, we include the employee step and column, so each year they um, that increases, the stirs and pers rates and the rate increases that are um, state um, mandated, uh, health and welfare contributions and increases, uh, LCAP expenditures, so everything that you just heard that. Um, Susan went through on the LCAP, all those are in the budget, in the um, budget year and out years. And we've included the certificated management um, negotiation settlements. CSEA is not included in that we haven't settled yet. And as uh, we will provide a more detailed list at the June 27th board meeting and any additional more information that comes to the district. Um, as we mentioned in our assumptions, I uh, wanted to point out that our enrollment is projected to be flat, um, but one of the items that I also want to look at is our average daily attendance. And right now we're at 94.9%. Um, there's an area that we would like to focus on, and we'll talk about some strategies later in the presentation, but we would love to increase our average daily attendance. Our general fund expenditures. Uh, this pie chart reflects uh, the outline of certificated salaries at 31%, a little bit over. Certificated salaries at 4.5, classified at 13.9, uh, classified management. Our employee benefits at 35.1, and, uh, and then it also covers books, supplies, um, services, and capital outlay. And so this is a big picture on our general fund expenditures and breaks it down uh, how we uh, provide that as a district. One of the challenges uh, that, you know, uh, there are items that we can control as a district and there are um, others that we are not able to control. One of those items is our stirs and purrs increase uh, within our multi-year. And so we just wanted to provide this chart to show um, both for our stirs from 17, 18 at uh, a little bit over 15 and a half percent to 2021 at 23%. And then for PERS uh, at 15.53% up to 20% in 2021. And so there is a steady increase uh, with both. And we are making sure that we are positioning the district as best as we can for those increases. Our multi-year projection, um, we'll go over our unrestricted, which this reflects our unrestricted, and then um, restricted, and then combined. So in regards to our unrestricted, um, for the, the various slides coming forward is uh, looking at our beginning balance, our revenues, and our expenditures. And so for 17, 18, you have 49.4 um, as our beginning balance. And you go through from the next columns to your right, you'll see that we're spending down our beginning balance. So our ending fund balance, which rolls over uh, to the outgoing year, is we're making sure to spend those dollars um, today um, as we move forward on today's students. And then with our incoming revenues and our expenditures, we're making sure that uh, we do so accordingly. Um, the contribution throughout in our multi-year is an area that we are also looking at um, and making sure as a district those items or investments that we take on, um, how we're spending our dollars and how to be more efficient. And so within the increase and decrease, that is our deficit spending. And so those at the, uh, for 2021, 20, uh, it's at 7.3 million. And for the current, it's uh, 1718 is 15.16. And so that's an area that we will focus on and um, making sure how to uh, become more efficient internally, both for unrestricted and restricted. One of the items that uh, in previous presentations is we wanted to break down what's in the total fund balance. 
And so here we have some asterisks that break down from our non-spendables, which is our revolving cash, cash on hand uh, at the county and or prepaid. Um, on asterisk two, a signed fund balance, that includes the uh, set aside for um, PVHS uh, for the facilities. And then um, if you look at 1819 on the assigned um, fund balance, you see the one-time fund. So in 17-18, you see it at 5.03, and it grows to 10.05. That is because the infusion of the one-time funds. And so on the second column, you'll see that. Uh, and so I just wanted to point that out. We spend down those one-time funds, so then in 1920, it reduces down to 4.1. And I'll explain uh, at a later slide uh, the one-time funds and the board support to move forward with that. Um, and then on the third asterisk, it's the board approved committed funds, and that's outlined. And the additional 3% reserve is also included in that, and then our committed fund balance. Um, this reflects our restricted. Uh, so this funding, majority of funding, has strings attached uh, from the state, federal, or local, and this reflects that. And I also wanted to point out um, as we previous slide is our beginning balance and how we're um, providing those expenditures uh, and drawing down on our beginning balance, our revenues and our expenditures. And then also gave a description on the total fund balance so we can give that uh, breakdown as well. We have a smaller uh, deficit in our increase and decrease um, column. So if I can just make one point, um, if you look at the fourth row, the contributions, um, that is where when you saw the, the monies from before with the negative, that's where this is coming from. So basically when you look at whether it's transportation, special education, other programs that we have that are not able to um, basically live within um, what they receive from the state, this is where that money is coming to. So it's going, our general fund money, and sometimes is covering our restricted um, funds. So the, um, to follow that comment, so the state funding uh, for restricted programs for transportation, special ed, and other, that funding is not uh, covering the cost to operate those, um, our expenses. And so that is under, under uh, transferred over from the unrestricted side. Um, and then this is the combined um, multi-year for both unrestricted and restricted. Uh, and uh, just wanted to point out, again, the beginning balance, the revenues and expenditures per year, and then our structural deficit in 2021 at $7.3 million, um, and then uh, breaking down our total fund balance. And we'll uh, go through here shortly and give a description of the um, support from the board on the one-time funds. Uh, of 19.4 million. Um, we did a great job in our facilities division and we made sure for, um, and I know some of our board members have taken site visits and looked at the roofs and bathroom renovations that we have throughout the district. Um, also committed some uh, furniture replacement. And so our procurement and purchasing department has done a great job uh, in fulfilling those orders and making sure that we have that furniture at our sites. Um, we also have, as Susan mentioned, in the LCAP and moving forward throughout curriculum and instruction, uh, our textbook adoptions, um, and that's um, being well spent. And then within the one-time funds, uh, golden rule is one-time uh, funding, one-time expenditures. And so we made sure to have one-time off-salary schedule for both classified and certificated. And so you have that there. And then the additional 3% reserve. And so that gives a summary of how we've um, managed uh, those funds, but spent them and um, invested those as board gave us that approval. So next steps. Um, we have our, our work cut out, but uh, definitely uh, working with um, the governor's office, uh, school services, and other agencies in, in our county, uh, making sure to get up-to-date current information uh, implement any of those additional um, changes and or approvals through the state level and make sure making sure that reflects within our um, living document our living budget um, we'll also work with the county to review and present to the board uh, at the next meeting that recommendation uh, based on the the input from the public hearing 
And then September, it will come back with our unaudited actuals. And that is like the pulse check to see where we're at uh, budget to our expenditures and see uh, to give an update there. Um, one of the things, and I'll let Helen talk to this a little bit about our staff and Helen are meeting with principals and you want to kind of give an overview of what those meetings look like? So we met with um, every school site, um, the principal and the office manager or the um, office personnel that um, worked with the budget. We met with them to go over what their budget would look like for next year and where they were spending this year. And one of the things that I um, instructed them is that I wanted to see them to spend at least 50 to 75% of their money by December because if they're not spending it by then, they're not spending it on the current year kids because if in prior years they'd rushed to spend their money in March and April and um, that's not money that could be spent on the current year kids. And so we've kind of worked with them on that. We'll continue those meetings. My staff meets with them at least quarterly. I will be meeting with them in the fall, probably September, early October timeframe to review what they submitted for their budget and where they're at with their spending. And then my staff will continue. And then I'll do another follow-up in March to see where they're at. And one of the other um, uh, internal efficiencies that that provides, it gives us milestones throughout the year, our fiscal calendar, and just making sure that all our school sites and our departments are on track within their budget, both to stay within their means, but also making sure that we're spending our dollars wisely. Um, inter other components that we're gonna be focusing on moving forward is our enrollment. And one of the, um, as I met with our superintendent is, we do some great work and we've enhanced a lot of our programs and we have a lot of uh, success within our district, but we really have to focus on marketing and PR and kind of um, pat ourselves in the back and get out, get the good news out there into the community and how we can uh, provide, um, you know, enhanced knowledge to our uh, community and constituents uh, for, to increase our enrollment. Um, also looking at uh, enrollment campaign which also includes looking at our parent handbook and the forms included in that and making sure that we have um, the necessary documents and that it's an easier process and user friendly for our parents and constituents to, to enroll in our schools. And then uh, also looking at an online enrollment process. Uh, for our average daily attendance, and I think some of you have mentioned it already, but review our Saturday school uh, program and how we can enhance that. So I'm working with um, Mark on that component. Um, and then we also looking at a, our bell schedules um, in alignment with our transportation bus routes. So making sure that the current process of picking up and dropping off our students, can we do that within the allotted time to make sure they get to school on time uh, in the start of school and the end of school and extracurricular activities, et cetera. Um, and then on this evening's agenda, you have attention to attendance. So making sure that we also partner with um, attention to attendance to making sure how to, uh, to inform parents the importance of sending our uh, children to school and um, assist us with the notifications and letters to families uh, when they're missing school. Um, another area that we're, uh, we have formed and the superintendent has been very supportive is forming a special ed task force. Um, this includes myself, um, our fiscal division, transportation, special ed, uh, child nutrition services, and HR. And it's a uh, team hands-on approach and supporting special ed and how we can be uh, more internally efficient um, from our door-to-door, -door, our transportation services, to providing uh, nutritious meals to our special ed population, um, to facilities and program space, et cetera. So what's internal and external uh, and non-public schools. So all of that, uh, this task force will take on and review. Um, and so, if, so if I can just say something in the ADA, another thing that we're planning on doing, and it was, it's actually been a request of, um, of Ms. Serpa for, um, for a while, is we're planning on um, doing attendance later in the day. So looking at um, trying to capture that attendance through <laughs> waiting 
um, a little bit so that we, we actually capture as much attendance as we can versus doing attendance and then having students come in 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late, and not capturing that attendance. So I know she's been asking for it for a while, so we're going to move it forward. <laughs> So once we finalize the, um, the bus routes, we'll have a standard time for attendance throughout the district. So then we could do a, a pulse check at one site, one side of the town to the other side of town. We know that attendance is being taken. Thank you. Um, and um, some great news, and, but it's pending. And that's why I said the, the budget is a living document. But um, right around the corner, we have with our legislature and our governor's office, um, we have some great opportunity. And I... Um, the word on the street is that this is coming, so I'm excited. Uh, we mentioned 100, 100 to 150 million in the CTE and the CTIG um, um, process, and then there's 150 million uh, in the CT consortium with our community college district. And so we are going to pursue both of them. Um, we also have to look internally and say, okay, what uh, assess what we have in place, and what does it take to um, compete with other districts for those funds. Um, another component um, that we as a district and I will partner with uh, HR and with Chona is our teacher workforce. There's about $75 million for teacher residency uh, grant. Um, these are going to be the positions that are hard to fill, math, science, and so this is support the STEM and STEAM um, uh, programs. And then there's uh, $50 million for local solutions grant, which is specific to special ed. Um, as Superintendent Rodriguez mentioned, the governor... There's an estimated um, 2.6 million through our LCFF. Uh, if that's approved, that'll potentially be for our district. And then one of the exciting uh, other sources of funding that's out there, and we are gonna partner up with, um, with Lisa and look in um, partnership with Victor and our facilities team, is what does it look like if we go down the path of full day kinder? Um, this is gonna be a competitive grant process, but there's $100 million through the state available for facilities. Um, so that's an area that we're also going to look at as well. Um, on behalf of our fiscal division, I'd like to thank the board for your time. Okay, so um, we have to see if we have speakers first and then it goes board comments. No. No. Okay, board comments. Thank Just you. Hero. <laughs> Is there, uh, with, the, with the hope that we're going to get more money <laughs> from the state, is that going to be labeled one-time money or can we count on that every year for salaries etc pardon me it's ongoing. so it's ongoing for now yeah. <laughs> it, it would require the legislature or the governor to do a reduction in education funding in order for that to happen but of course that could happen but we are very happy that it's additional LCFF funding because the one-time monies has been a challenge for us um, and so we are very happy that it's ongoing and it's stable funds um, because it allows us to dedicate additional funds to those other priorities that we saw at the top including facilities um, and and Baba. <laughs> Thank you. Good. And Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hey, Karen. Um, well, I just want to ask a small little question. So I, I saw that there was money in there for facilities, but I also said I saw that there was monies in there for full day kindergarten. So that's monies that you, we can request or try to from the state level it's available for districts in california but it's competitive so we're going to have to it's for, it's for facilities only um so that's the other component we have to do an internal assessment because it only covers facilities uh the capital outlay of of setting up rooms or building new construction or modernization of buildings so when so he says competitive he means a grant so we'd have to we'd have to write a grant and apply for it apply for the mm -hmm. full day kindergarten correct however i think because I mean, of our because of our demographics and also our achievement i we i think we would have a good really good chance of receiving the competitive grant 
But as Joe mentioned, we have to look at it just came out. So um, we have to look at it as a whole. However, I think that people that know me know that um, I do believe in early intervention and strong um, early literacy support. And having a half-day K um, with students that are fragile student populations is a challenge. And so it would be something that we would um, very much look into so that we could see if we could manage it. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Kim, do you have anything? So do we have a line item in this budget that has ongoing um, ex expenditures for furniture refresh? Because we kind of had started that process, but it was like a tiny little fraction of what was actually needed. So I was hopeful that we would have that in our budget every year so that we could continue to yeah, refresh all the furniture uh, in the district. The ongoing is about 200000 that we have for ongoing. Um, and one of the things that we are currently doing uh, internal efficiencies is looking at our inventory district-wide um, and what we have at the elementary, middle, and high school and talk about furniture and what is uh, still good usable furniture that could be transferred from one site to another site. So we're looking at that, but then we're also looking at replacement um, and the 21st century grants that are available uh, for 21st century learning. So if there, if there is any um, additional monies, I would like to see that as something that's prioritized because that has something to do with facilities. And I know in many of our schools we were using furniture that was like literally decades old falling apart. and falling apart. I mean, if it was still good, it, that's great, but it, but it just isn't. And um, I know a lot of the classrooms, it was kind of up to the teachers to let their principals know. And then if they didn't, they didn't get in the queue. And so we have a humongous need to um, improve our classroom we have not situations. we have not confirmed yet but I know the state uh, there's potential for additional one-time funds but that isn't um, been announced if uh, if so there's opportunity to look at one-time funding for one-time expenditures expenditures such as furniture and or equipment and so that'll be something we can uh, definitely look at okay and then in terms of our school budgets per um, school site I know that they vary um, with, and, and they're not completely equal across the board. So, but I would like to see the Aptos schools get a, their fair share of budget. Um, in past years, millions of dollars have gone south and central following the kids. And so with the L, new LCAP, I thought that we had an opportunity to make things more equitable for the schools in Aptos. And I'm just wondering if you could tell me what, are, are we going to ever get to a, a time when we have discretionary dollars that are equal across our schools? So currently we have um, site discretionary money that is across the district. It's a per ADA amount for each school. So depending on what their, uh, or it's per their enrollment. Um, there's LCFF supplemental funds that is across the district. The only difference uh, would be Title I um, because the Aptos schools don't have the free and reduced um, percentages that qualify for Title I. So that's the only funding at this point um, that they wouldn't have. Um, if the schools participate in Saturday school, they get a portion of the revenue that comes back to us in that from that. So um, that, I know Aptos High and I, there's a couple, another school, couple schools I think in the Aptos area that get that also. If they have Saturday schools. Right, if they have Saturday schools. We could take a look at that and look at um, equity throughout the district. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd like to um, express sincere gratitude about the revamping of the parent handbook. It's <laughs> 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 been a difficult thing to have to re fill out those pages and it's the same exact information and you have to sign in like 100 places. It's very frustrating. So it's great if we can improve that and do it at online version would be great. Um, I love the new ADA. I'm taking role later. I think that that will will, ca will immediately capture probably like 1.5 to 2 percent right there. 
And Say that um, again. I can't hear you. Can I'm you? sorry. Just with the new, like taking role later will, will be very helpful. Yeah. And um, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Trustee Acosta, do you have anything? Not at this time. Thank you. Willie? Okay. So I have a couple of questions. Um, um, the ADA, it was 94.6. Is that what you said on average? 94.9. Something like that. Okay, so that's over like over 600 absences estimated per day. So we could potentially we could capture a lot. And I know there's a lot of different reasons. Some like for instance, we have Renaissance that's way out there, hard for students to get to. So I think it's going to be a really wide lens that we have to look at. But I'm glad you are. Um, I don't recognize my own note. Okay. So the CTE money, I believe that has not signed yet for the workforce money. Correct. It's not um, I think I heard you say it was competitive, but I don't think it's competitive. I think it's. Yes, there's there's some that are competitive. Some, um, some of them are competitive. The $150 million with the consortia, is that competitive? Uh, oh, okay. And what about the CTE incentive grant? Is that one? There's going to be, that is very competitive. Oh, um, wow. The consortium okay. uh, through the community colleges, it's going to be for at the community college level. Uh, they're given their, if you want to call it their fair share, mm -hmm. but then it's the districts that can provide the necessary services through CTE. So that's where we really talked about doing an internal assessment and talking about our CTE coordinator and uh, where we're at as a district and where we want to go. And so it's kind of um, and working with our superintendent and um, trying to align ourselves to, um, to be successful. Okay, thank you for well, clarifying that. That's why you have the job you do. And <laughs> um, so when Trustee Deserpa was talking about furniture and replacement, do we get money for disposal of our surplus furniture and equipment? So um, on this evening's agenda, you have some surplus uh, property, and some is um, actually just surplus and it's disposed of. And then other property, I believe there is, um, is Richard here? If we have a, a trailer from our maintenance department on tonight's agenda. I'm, that, I didn't hear you. What uh, the, there's a uh, trailer that's on tonight's agenda for surplus property, uh -huh. equipment trailer. And so I'm using that as an example that we can resell that. And okay. so then that revenue comes back to the district. Okay. But then there's other surplus property, uh, such as e-waste, uh, keyboards, computers, uh, et cetera, um, that we do get funding for, um, broken furniture, et cetera, then it's just right. uh, surplus. Okay. So it just But depends. there is some that we can capture some dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then you were talking about assessing our transportation, and um, I'm, I'm wondering if this had been brought up a couple of times by Trustee DeSerpa about looking at the possibility of later start times for high schools. I know that's huge, and I don't want to cause a big um, scare, but assessing if that's possible because it's been um, uh, found that it's related to student achievement. If um, the upper grades get more sleep, they actually do better. So I'm wondering if that's a part of that transportation assessment, because I know that's that's probably going to be the biggest issue around that. Yeah, so of um, off of the, the request, we did um, make a promise that at the start of next school year, we will be doing a parent survey um, with the parents. We also, nothing has been discussed other than I did have start my conversation with um, with Mr. Rodriguez um, from PVFT of just letting him know that we're starting the research process um, and that we needed to start having input from teachers from staff from parents to first um, assess where we are with that and 
um, if it's desired, if what the difficulties would be. Um, we want to take it fairly slowly um, just because it can cause quite an issue with parents. Of course, we're very student-centric here, so mm -hmm. we care about that. But we just need to get a lot of data that we don't currently have and just get um, information from people. So we are dedicated to do that um, and to start the, the process because we, we recognize that um, having an 18-year-old that if he could sleep in until 10 o'clock, he would. Um, I, and he's really <laughs> not very alert um, at 8 a.m., no less 7 a.m., um, then I, I get the need. Um, so we're going to start working on it. Okay. We've already started conversations, but I, just conversation about having a conversation. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you From so much. From an operational perspective, we're looking at with our routing software and the amount of students we have on a route and how, how long that route is of travel time when we pick up a, a child, whether that child's in elementary or high school, how long are they on that bus to get to school at a certain time? And so we're also looking at internal efficiencies in regards to ride or travel time. And traffic, right? That's traffic, huge, all those, especially yeah. crab toss. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, those were all my questions. Are there any other questions or comments from the I board? do, just really quickly. Um, so if, if our sites um, do not end up spending um, the dollar amount that they uh, receive, the site money, do they carry over? No. No. Okay. Um, there are uh, the only ones that we look at are our Title uh, One. Um, there are very few, but the Could you site, move the microphone closer? The site, the site allocations are not carried over, but some of our Title One dollars are rolled over. All right, and in the past, how many schools have actually spent that money? We can provide a, a breakdown of that. Um, we have that information. Um, I'll just say generally um, what we're trying to enhance is best practices, so all our sites uh, stay within their budgets. Some sites underspent, some sites are close to at par, and some sites go over. And so our goal is to make sure that everyone stays within their budget. So in instances where it does go over, what do we do? Then it's a contribution from the general fund. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And then um, I did have, I'm just really excited about the possibility of um, a day-long kindergarten. I'm really excited about the fact that we have now um, transitional kinder at almost our school side. So I'm really happy uh, that we're going to be going after that grant. Mm -hmm. especially with scheduling for parents who have multiple children in the district. They have to find a way to do different pickup times for different children. Um, so I think that will be very beneficial to our community. Um, and then as far as truancy, what is the follow-up? I know that parents do receive letters, but I personally know families who have more than three absences and um, there's no follow-up by our district. So what do we do in those cases? Dan? You're on. Oh, well, she's coming up. Yep, she's um, As far as the follow-up process, we do have the SARB process. Um, oh, once I, a student, I can't hear you that well. Put your mic up. We have the SARB process once a student has 10% um, uh, attendance issues and there are many many more referrals than we can get to but we do have SARB once a month and if the students continue to not um, do well or to come to school then they may end up in truancy mediation and that's also once a month. Um, we do have the letters through A2A that are sent out after this, the second letter. A third letter does not go out until the parent will schedule a conference with the site administration. Would you um, say what SARB stands for, just because we have Sorry. this audience, but also a television audience? It's the School Attendance Review Board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Those were all my. Okay. Anyone else? A comment? Go ahead, Bill and Willie. Um, uh, thank you guys uh, very much. You know, you have to be excited about what's happening. You gotta be excited about where we've been and where we're going and it's and and tonight has been a great example of uh people ready i i feel a certain amount of confidence in not only the budget but lcap and everything that that we have seen tonight so it it's it'll it'll be 
it'll be fun because we have a we have a plan. We got excellent people that made the plan, execute the plan, and now we got hopefully some money to make the plan happen. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so don't go too far, Joe. <laughs> I believe you're on the next one also. So I'm going to um, close um, item seven public hearing and open item eight, also a public hearing on special education um, annual budget and service plan. And Heather, sorry. Heather wasn't on here, sorry. Sorry, Heather. <coughs> Welcome, Heather. So good evening, Hi. President DeRose. Microphone up, yes. Is Micro it? Can Speak you hear now? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Good evening. Say it again. Okay. President DeRose, board members, Dr. Rodriguez. So I'm going to give you an overview of the annual budget and um, service plan for special education and, and services. This is a public hearing that has been done at the district office in the past years, and now we're bringing it here. And you've seen our budget come through the board, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what it is that you're looking at. So, if, oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. So, our annual budget and service plan, the local plan, and this is what you're looking at, should include a section stating that the SELPA will adopt an annual budget and service plan following all legal requirements. And I'm going to go over in later slides what the requirements are for this. And the actual annual service and budget plans are submitted separately from the rest of the local plan and um, the budget plan. So they'll be, su they'll be submitted together, but they are sec separate documents. So prior to submission, both the budget and the service plan must be adopted at a public hearing. That's what we're doing tonight. So notice of the hearing must be posted in each school and in your packet you received um, what our notices are. We did this more than 15 days in advance so that it's out to every single school in the district and it's posted in an area that's supposed to be where people can see it. Um, the budget and service plans are made of uh, plans that may be revised during the fiscal year. Um, the annual budget plan must include administrative cost of the plan, services to students with severe and low incidence disabilities. So that's um, disabilities as, such as a hearing impairment where it's not, it's a low incidence, not many students have these disabilities, visually impaired. Um, services to students with non-severe disabilities, so that's mild, moderate, you find services such as RSP classes, mild, moderate, special day classes, um, supplemental aids and services to meet individual needs of students placed in general education classes. At times we have students that, have hard, that are hard of hearing that need sound filled systems, so that's in the general class. And then regionalized operation services and direct instructional support by our program specialists. So the annual service plan must include a description of the nature of services, including related services. So a related service to an IEP is speech and language, um, BI services, it's related to their disability. Um, the physical location of where the services are provided and which may include alternative schools, charter schools, Opportunity day schools operated by the school district, such as New School. Community day schools operated by the County Office of Education, regardless of whether the district or County Office of Education participates in the local plan. I put some examples there too, Sequoia Freedom Community School. So we do serve students that go to all of these programs. Non-public school agencies, such as the Bay School, Rebecca's Children's Center, Oasis, Esther B. Clark School. And that's basically what the plan is, what's in it, but this is the time if you have questions about it. Do we have board or um, any public comment? No. Okay. 
um, board comments, questions? Okay. Um, I, I'll have one. Um, yes. So I was just, I was just going to ask if um, how special education functions for just students who are in regular education. My daughter had an IEP. Um, you know, the students that are out there in regular, you know, she was at regular school sites. Um, how, I'm just interested, how does, how does special ed work with those kind of students, <laughs> to be honest with you? I mean, I, I actually would, you know, go and talk to the teachers every year and show them what, you know, what kind of, you know, how, what my daughter needed to be supported in school and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes I would talk to the psychologist at the, at the high school um, and, you know, make sure, you know, work with her. But I was just wondering <laughs> how it, you know, I mean, I know you do, you know, what you call severe, moderate, and, but th that's not actually what she is. She was, I don't know, she was, was, yeah, she was completely mainstream. Yeah, she was completely yeah. mainstream. And, and it all depends on, and that's why they call it individualized education plans, um, on students' needs. So annually, we look at every student's needs and according to their IEP. So you build up, you know, with their assessments, you build a plan to meet their needs. And if that means in the general education class, they need support accommodations, modifications to curriculum. Okay. We have people go in to do that kind of support. We have inclusion specialists that might go in and work with a teacher and say, this is how you can modify the curriculum so this child can access that okay. curriculum. Okay, so you have to go in and do all that for the students all throughout the whole district. Well, that's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wasn't aware that we also serviced non-public schools. We do. Um, well, so is there a benefit to doing that? It, do, 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 does a dis as a district do we receive additional funding to also be able to provide services? We provide. We fund the school, so that's part of what we do. It's we don't send. Um, we don't send staff members in as teachers or. Um, well, at times, actually, we have provided SLP services to a non-public school where they didn't have that service for a student. Um, but for the most part, it's our program specialists that go in and support the school in helping run the IEP meeting, making sure that everything is done correctly and that the students are getting the services that they need. But we're not necessarily sending a staff member in to say, this is a service we provide and teach the student because the school itself, like the base school, they have all the staff members they need to provide that service. But we do have a program specialist that goes in and sits at every IEP meeting. From, and from uh, an internal assessment, one of the things that the task force will take on in, in partnership with our SELPA is look at internally, when we look at non-public schools, it's um, either a facility capacity issue or staffing issue of what services can we handle internally versus externally. And so with that being said, that's something that we're also looking at within our non-public schools is what is available internally versus a non-public school. Yeah. Thank you. I was just going to ask too. So are they contracting with us for services? Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> and and there's, there's different ways, but part of it is that they contract with us or settlement agreements or there are students that that is the best placement for that student and it's an IEP team decision. So it's more common really in um, uh, for school districts not to have their own SELPA. It's usually at the county office, correct? And that would happen in, uh, in counties like that where they would go to the county office for those services. For our, well, so we, we're providing. Yeah, for our life skills programs, we provide those services. We're a self-contained SELPA, so we provide all of our life skills program here where in other, like in Santa Cruz, they have a county office. It's smaller now, mm -hmm. but they do provide some of the services at the county office of certain programs, but we don't have that. Right, okay. Karen, did you have anything? Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, <sighs> So in some cases, you decide that that certain student would need one of the non-public services, or 
it is often the parents that want it, right? Isn't the parents that request that their child go to one of these non-public schools? I'm not sure how that works. I mean, I, I would have... We have to offer as a district what we really feel is a free and appropriate public education. In special education language, we call that FAPE. Uh -huh. So if we have the program that meets the students' needs within the district, we offer the program that's the district program first and foremost, as we think we can serve these students and do a good job. Yeah. There are certain students at times that may need a more restrictive, and I call the, the programs that are the um, like the Bay School, Esther B. Clark, they're a more restrictive environment than what we offer in a public school. They may need a program like that, but we always try to offer the public school setting first. Yeah, that's what I was hoping because I, I know we are, I forgot, I think we have more autistic children at our district now than we used to, or, or we have we have more programs for them than we used to, and we used to have to send many of them to other schools, but now they're here. Is, isn't that accurate? We, we are definitely building our autism program. We have a new program that's going into play this next year, so we are trying to make sure that we have the programs that meet their needs instead of having to send a student to the base school yeah, and, so and or bring students back to our district. Right. Uh -huh. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. Was that yes? Um, so I know that um, we get a certain amount of money um, for special education, which is how much? Well, we, ha we have federal and state money that we ha receive every year. Um, I could look at the... Speak into the mic, oh. please. Thank you. We do um, receive federal and state money every year for special education. It's a small portion of what's funded compared to what we need to. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So what's the percentage that special ed encroaches into the general fund? Helen, this maybe Helen is. I, I do have a slide on that. We're about um, total um, about 28 million. Um, and it's roughly, and I know we're in the, it's above 10%, um, but that's something also that we're looking at in partnership with Heather and her team. Um, and really the approach is how to become, just making sure, I think she touched on it about making sure that we have the right services aligned for, or for each child and how to be more efficient internally in providing those services. And so that's the goal of the task force uh, to review um, the big picture um, and one of those items, as we mentioned, is non-public non schools and the services. Um, so we're going to be reviewing all the items. Aren't we required legally to provide services to kids even if they're at a non-public school, like psychological testing, et cetera? Yes, we are. Yeah, so it's, a, it's actually required by law, right? It'll be interesting to hear what kind of internal controls we could affect. I'm not sure what we can, but it'll be, that'll be an interesting report. So I noticed that you're not currently utilizing social workers in any of the special ed services. It's not checked. <laughs> I think that would be a nice addition, helping kids and families get what they need. If you notice, we have quite a few that are checked and very few that are not checked. <laughs> um, and that does happen to be one of them. But we, are, we do have, and I think you know this, educationally related mental health services for our students. Okay, so if that is all, then I'm going to go ahead and close this public hearing and open our last public hearing. So closing eight and opening public hearing under item nine, and this is a Sunshine proposal for a multi-year agreement um, with CSEA. Yes, President Rose, Board Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez, Government Code 3547, the RADA Act, requires bargaining proposals to be presented for public comment or sunshined. Um, PBUSD submits two additional proposals to the three already approved at a prior board meeting as we would like to update the outdated language and ensure compliance with current laws and regulation. Uh, thanks uh, very much to our Director of Transportation, Katie Powell, and HR uh, Director, uh, Pam Shanks, for their expertise on uh, these proposals. 
Uh, the two proposals are Article 16, which involves compensation for training and compliance with current uh, DMV regulations for certifications of school bus drivers. And then the second proposal is Article 30, which involves the drug and alcohol testing language, which dates back to the omnibus bill of 1991. Um, we, we, we need to comply with the changes to the laws governing drug testing for safety sensitive positions, including bus drivers. Okay, thank you. And do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment? None. Okay. Um, any comments from the board or questions? Okay, if not, and when will we be voting on I should ask you. <laughs> These items that we just went through the public hearing, when are they coming for action? All four of them will be, or three of them will be coming for action um, at the next board meeting on okay. the 27th, June 27th. Okay, so this was our opportunity to get clarification. Yes. And, okay, mm -hmm. great. And so, if I would just one second, yeah. um, I would ask if they're in between then and now, if you have any additional comments or concerns, I ask that you please do direct them to me. Um, as we have said before, they must be approved before June 30th. It does not give us any time to make additional changes. Um, so you do have two weeks in order to be able to respond to me. So I just ask that I'm um, here for you. Anything that you need, please just reach out to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm closing um, the public hearing under item nine and opening up the regular uh, meeting agenda once again. And we're at um, item 10 visitor non-agenda items. Do we have any public None. comment? Okay, so we'll move to item 11, employee organization comments. Wow. Um, 11.1 .1 is PVFT. Um, thank you, Francisco Rodriguez with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, uh, just a, a couple things. First, I uh, uh, just want to uh, congratulate the board on turning down uh, n uh, navigator schools. I think that uh, that was a very good uh, decision on your part and a great presentation by uh, the staff with regards to um, whether the proposal was um, adequate or not. Um, I'm, I hope that uh, they stay away from Santa Cruz County as well as other uh, charter maintenance organizations. Um, uh, in addition, I also wanted to just um, uh, point out a couple things. Uh, first of all, the uh, uh, I think it's a great idea to have a, a special education task force uh, and would love to be uh, part of it, uh, to participate as we know that uh, in the past, many of the decisions uh, directly impact our members uh, when it comes to, for example, uh, how, um, uh, well, one particular example a few years back is when uh, special education uh, instructional aides who, you know, we don't represent were uh, reassigned. It has a direct impact on our members, the certificated staff. Um, and so we'd like to be part of it, and uh, we also would like to, of course, uh, give you impact uh, input from the uh, staff uh, to uh, be able to see any, um, foresee any problems or impacts upon their working conditions. Um, I also, along those, that same line, in your uh, consent agenda item 14.6 staffing contracts uh, you don't have any uh, specific information there but there is a total of about two million dollars in costs and I'm hoping that the uh, special education uh, task force addresses those um, that you know that problem because um, that's two million dollars that can be uh, used for other purposes uh, uh, that would directly uh, improve uh, the working conditions of the employees and um, give a greater benefit, we believe. Um, and then finally, um, I also, uh, we've had experience, as you know, with uh, full day kinder in the past uh, at Ohlone School. Uh, at that time, uh, there was no 
uh, coordination or uh, participation of the bargaining units in its development, and it created um, a lot of problems at the site. And so, again, we would not like to be part of uh, any plans to uh, expand full day kinder at our schools. And so I'm confident that um, uh, either through human resources or through the superintendent's office uh, will be reached out to uh, provide the necessary input from our members. Thank you. And do we have anyone from CSEA here tonight? Pavam? Or CWA? Okay. So we'll move to item 12.0. These are action items. 12.1. Um, is the adoption of the declaration of need for fully qualified teachers. And this is by Dr. Colleen again. Yes, thank you, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. <coughs> um, there's been a nationwide shortage of teachers for several years now, and California and PVSD included in that. Accordingly, public school districts all over the state submit an annual declaration of need to the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing to address the huge teacher shortages, requesting waivers of requirements for licensing and preparation. Um, PVUSD has submitted this declaration for several years, at least five years and counting, um, as similar to a vast majority of the districts in California, um, as there is not sufficient number of people who meet our employment criteria. Um, PVUSD has an annual shortage of appropriately credentialed teachers in the following areas, bilingual education, special education, math science. And when shortages in the area of special education and these other areas occur, uh, the Department of Special Services employs a variety of means to help reduce the shortage, internship programs, waivers, and emergency credentialing. While we need the board adopted declaration, the annual shortage at PVUSD will be less um, as a result of job fairs, publicity, early postings, administrators working hard with HR, especially our new director, Allison Niazawa, um, to expedite the interview and selection processes, we are looking at uh, about half of the remaining vacancies compared to the same time period from last year. However, we still respectfully request that the board approve our declaration um, to make sure that we do employ a sufficient number of teachers to fulfill our obligations to the students and to our community. Thank you. Do we have any speakers to this item? None. Okay. And any questions or comments from the board? No. Uh, so I just have a quick comment. This this come it's called the annual declaration of need, and I've seen it for twelve years now. I, the goal would be to never have to ask for a waiver or an emergency credential, right? So, um, and I just wanted to commend you on your early recruitment efforts. I think you started in January, is that right? Yeah. Which is a amazing. And I didn't know that we were at 50% of uh, where we were last year. So congratulations. That's And we're getting the cream of the crop by going early. Yes, we, so. um, we're already at 50% less, and we haven't had to utilize um, STIPS, which is short-term teaching permits, um, and uh, PIPs, which are provisional interim permits. So we haven't had to use a lot of the emergency uh, so far. And we're still recruiting. We have interviews coming up, a whole bunch of them. Um, and it's uh, a lot of work, not just from HR, but with the administrators that are um, helping us and our superintendent and our PIO and everybody else and, and PVFT as well um, go out there and, and publicize our school as one of the, uh, working with our teachers as one of the best experiences out there. So I mentioned that you started recruitment in January. When's the earliest that you began, and I don't know if it's signing them or getting a letter of intent, or when did you start getting commitments? Um, we started with job fairs, and we um, gave conditional contracts at the job fairs um, from uh, the first one, which was at uh, Cal State Monterey Bay. And we also are working with the teachers there so that we can bring in student teachers mm -hmm. and then grow our, uh, our, our people from within and, and develop that. So we are working to uh, increase our contacts with the colleges and universities. And that was like in January? January. So what that says to me is people aren't waiting 
until they have no other choice to come to PVUSD. They're coming, they're choosing us first. Yes. And that's for a reason. So that's that says really, really good things about our district. So I just I want people to keep that in mind. So and it's gonna get better with our student achievement. So and thank we're you. We're excited about the new people coming in. Yes, good. So are we. So this is an action item. So uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Approval. Okay, do you want to do second? We'll do okay, Maria. Second. Motion and Karen second. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 601. Thank you. Um, so this is the one public hearing that um, is on as an action item, and this is the Sunshine proposal for the multi-year agreement for CSEA. Um, we've had the discussion and public comment. So um, does would anyone like to make a motion? Move we'll approval. Okay, a second? Second. Okay. Aaron, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, motion passes 601. And item 12.3, the interim reclassification criteria. And who's giving this report? Dr. Gottlob. Dr. Gottlob, hi. Welcome. I forgot what an interim means. What well, we're going to find out. Good evening, President DeRose, members of the board, and Superintendent Rodriguez. I'm Jean Gottlob, Director of Equity, State and Federal Programs, and Accountability. And I'm sure that everyone in this room knows that we, many of our students come to us as English learners. So these students are learning English in addition to learning the subject and the content at school. So as students move along the pathway of gaining English proficiency, there comes a time when they are declared to be working at the same level as their, you know, as their classmates who uh, were born speaking English or who are English only students. So in the past, the state has set this criteria, but since uh, we have had recent changes in state testing, we went from the CSTs to the SBAC, and now we also have changed from the CELT, which we've had for many, many years, to a new, a new um, English language proficiency assessment called the <coughs> LPAC. The LPAC, the English language, Prof English language proficiency assessments of California. So on January 2nd, all California districts were informed of the following by the California Department of Education. Um, because the LPAC scores are preliminary, the local education agencies may determine their own LPAC threshold scores in combination with the general performance level descriptors for reclassification purposes until the State Board of Education approves the final threshold scores in the fall of 2018 at which time the CDE will provide new reclassification guidance for the 2018-19 school year and beyond. So this is our proposed uh, interim reclassification criteria to be used at the beginning of this school year, this coming school year, until we receive the new reclassification re guidance from the state. And what's different about this is we have sort of a two-tiered system. Um, we decided that if students reach the highest level of the LPAC, which was well developed, and they had no scores less than three with the oral and written, and if they had a minimum score on the SBAC meeting the standard, which is level three, or our own um, internal, well, it's not really our own internal, but NWEA MAP RIT scores, if they were reading at or above the mean, and they had the teacher evaluation, and we had the parent opinion and consultation that those students would qualify for reclassification. But we, but we want to make sure that we're, we call it, we're reclassifying all the students who are really functioning at that high level. So we wanted to bring an, in another um, criteria that is for students who are reached the level of LPAC 3, which is moderately developed, overall with oral and written language scores at least three. And if those, since they're not at the highest level of the LPAC, but if they can have a minimum score at mid-level of meets criteria uh, of being proficient on the SBAC 
or they have the NWEA MAP RIT score reading or at or above mean, that those students would also qualify. So this is something new, and this is, un this is interim because the state has not come out with their own reclassification guidance yet. Do we have any speakers to this item? None. No? Any comments or questions from the board? Willie? Yeah. Thank you. Is this, um, is this watering down the standards or moving the standards up? This is neither. At the moment, we're not really sure because the threshold scores haven't been set yet by the state, but we know that if the students reach the highest score on the LPAC and if they're meeting the standard, if they're proficient on the SBAC, that those students are performing at a high level. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. This I, is an act. Sorry. I'd like to just make a comment that uh, Dr. Gottlieb and I were on the uh, on the Watsonville High School podium, or passing out the uh, the uh, diplomas, and I was really touched by her greeting and the kids greeting her, who were seniors, who had her as an eighth grade principal. It was like a magic time, and it was really good. So thank you. It was very exciting. <laughs> okay, so this is an action item. So um, I'll entertain a motion I'll make a motion a second okay so Maria and Kim um, all those in favor aye. aye aye any opposed okay motion passes 601 thank you item 12.4 um, this is one of the board policies that we've been bringing back on a regular basis to update them and this one is wellness policy and so this is a first reading so we can ask questions get clarification give board input and then it will come back a second reading right um for for um action so this is under action items though do we approve the first reading or should it be yeah. actually moved to report and discussion? Yeah, so we, we've had some questions on, on where to put this. We probably should create a new item where we put it, um, where it just talks about board policies, because technically this is not an action item. However, um, we do request direction from the board um, on this so that then by the time it's at the it's second reading, we can approve it. So tech, we probably can put it under presentation from now on when it's first okay. reading. So if there are any suggested changes by the board, we can approve it with the changes that we had agreed on yeah so we okay. this is a first reading so this is your opportunity to say between now and the next board meeting uh -huh. to give us input okay so that at the next board meeting we can approve it so we're not approving it tonight so okay. i'm i'm recognizing your point we can in the future we'll put it under um discussion item okay when it's first reading okay thanks hi there all right good evening uh, president de rose members of the board superintendent rodriguez um, I'm excited to, uh, and this is a fun item for me and a personal item um, uh, regarding our wellness uh, policy from our last uh, board meeting. Uh, the request was to provide deeper um, uh, details and information of the overall um, wellness policy and how our students are impacted overall. Um, not just the well-being, but the physical, social, uh, safe and healthy uh, learning environment. So all of that composed into, um, into this policy, and we were excited to present it this evening. Um, I did not know when I signed up and joined uh, the district um, that this was going to be in partnership uh, with Linda Liu. And my first interaction, how this first happened on the wellness policy, uh, we had a working lunch, and I had, um, and she still reminds me to this day, I had a small basket of french fries, and she <laughs> pulled it from my, uh, in front of me and gave me a salad and some fruits and veggies. And so she started at the top and it has worked. And so I'm doing my best. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to commend uh, Linda Liu and the rest of the team members. We have Becca, Patrick, John, and April. 
And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Linda, and she'll go through the presentation. All right, good evening. Thank you for having our group um, present today. Um, as Joe stated, we did uh, bring this to the board last month on May 9th. Um, and after some questions, it was requested that uh, we come back for some more uh, presentations. So we have a group together tonight um, to do some quick uh, presentations and then we can follow up with any kind of questions. So in general, we're following the um, the flow of the actual wellness policy and so we'll be covering um, uh, nutrition and student meals so I'll be presenting on our uh, department here um, I have my food core service member who will be speaking tonight uh, Becca McKnight um, and I also work uh, in partnership with Patrick Littleton who's um, also under extended learning and he'll talk about the different hats that he wears uh, within the district um, we have the pleasure of having John Fisher here from Life Lab, um, a local uh, group that does wonderful things in our district for many years, and they'll be presenting tonight. Uh, we do not have a speaker um, for uh, physical activity and PE, but um, I'm sure um, any number of people can help to answer any questions if any come up. Uh, school health and safety, we have uh, the school nurses represented by April uh, Alamon and uh, PVPSA with Angela Novella and Erica Padilla Chavez here tonight, and then uh, Salud Para La Gente will be covering um, their community health clinic, and they are also working uh, with student health. Um, so for uh, the Food and Nutrition Services Department, we're the uh, department here feeding the students of the district. Uh, so our department has over 100 staff, and that makes up uh, the kitchens, uh, the warehouse who do the receiving and delivery, and then our office staff that run the, the uh, federal program. Um, we serve breakfast and lunch at all PVUSD schools, with the exception of SABA, uh, plus after-school snacks at various sites. Um, under another federal program, we also do childcare feeding, which feeds birth through five years at nine PVS, PVUSD sites, and that feeds the programs under child development and migrant and seasonal Head Start. So um, in an average year, we serve about one million breakfast, student breakfasts, almost two million student lunches, a half million after-school snacks, and uh, during the gap time of the summer, we offer in a seamless summer federal program, which feeds one through 18 year olds um, and are open to the community um, for anyone through 18 to come and eat um, at any site that, that is, is providing meals under our program. So a little bit quickly about our menus. And so in feeding the students of PVUSD, um, our main focuses are on, of course, um, food safety, um, we look a lot at food quality. Um, we're always welcoming and trying to get student feedback, being culturally relevant with our menu choices, um, always looking at promoting healthy choices, trying to do more with freshly prepared meals, uh, despite kind of the you know aging um, uh, kitchen and setup. Uh, we try to source local ingredients whenever possible. Um, we try to get take advantage of where we are and get seasonal fresh produce. And in doing that, we've been starting to bring salad bars back into the schools. Um, they are uh, present daily in high schools starting this year, and we did a pilot to start at two elementary schools this year. So beyond the daily meal service um, and just wanting to promote health and wellness in general, um, be beyond what we're doing in terms of feeding, uh, we apply for yearly grants uh, through the state, CDE, um, to get the fresh fruit and vegetable program. And we are usually, on average, receiving over $300,000 a year for the past, um, I believe, at least six or seven years. Um, and so up to 12 elementary sites have been able to provide a free healthy snack at recess time where they get fresh um, fruits and vegetables provided for free, uh, which Patrick Littleton will speak more about. Uh, partnering with Food Corps, this is our second year and I just returned from uh, the training for next year. We'll be partnering with Food Corps again and so there's a uh, small fee that we pay. Food Corps is under the Amer um, AmeriCorps and there's a, with a small fee that we pay them, we're able to provide our Food Corps service member working on projects for a full school year, 1,700 hours, and um, they're doing 
uh, lessons uh, in classrooms and working with students and modeling healthy eating behaviors. Um, also, uh, we apply for the community eligibility provision, and so there is universal access to free meals, breakfast and lunch at 18 schools currently, and we're looking to grow that. So as we work on all the services that we provide, we're trying to connect more with families and with students and highlight what's going on in the school cafeterias, whether it's the daily meal service or any of these other promotions that we're trying to do. Started our Instagram this year with the help of our food core service member, and we're trying to expand that. So, um, and like we said, as we try to, um, as we work on what we're offering, we're also trying to promote it and let people know and the, let people and parents know that we're doing this. And so this is our second year working at the community health fair, talking about the school meals. Um, this is with um, our food core and also our nutrition intern from San Jose State. Um, and beyond that, um, our Website now has interactive menus with all nutrition information and food allergens available for parents to look up, um, students to look up, and that way they can have full transparency about what they're eating. Um, and we're providing a lot of resources for parents also on our website. So um, as we continue to do more things, we um, will be using that platform to connect um, easily uh, with parents in that way, but also trying to go out and be on site at places to connect with them as well. So next, I'd like to introduce Becca McKnight, who's our Food Corps Service Member for the 17-18 school year. Hello, thank you, Linda. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm the Food Corps Service Member currently. Um, and if you're wondering a little bit more about what Food Corps does, as she mentioned, it is a branch of AmeriCorps. And Okay, sorry, better? Um, it is a branch of AmeriCorps. Food Corps is a national nonprofit working to connect kids to healthy food in schools. And we do that through focusing on three pillars, those being hands-on lessons, healthy school meals, and a school-wide culture of health. So I'm just going to briefly share with you the way we integrate those three pillars into PVUSD. Um, one being through our Harvest of the Month program, which is an individually local, locally grown fruit or vegetable that we feature on the line throughout on a month-to-month -month basis. So we incorporate new foods into the meals, introduce students to new locally grown produce, and the goal is to familiarize students with seasonality and to increase their consumption and preference for those fresh and healthy foods. One way that we promote our Harvest of the Month program is through implementing district-wide taste testing. <laughs> so last month we featured strawberries from JSM Organics. We made a lot of strawberry salsa for all of the school sites. And um, Javier Zamora, the head farmer at JSM Organics on the right, actually made it out to a school site with me. And we were able to talk to students about the importance of eating locally and connecting them to where their food comes from. And we also sampled out three different varieties of his delicious strawberries. Um, one of those pillars is also hands-on lessons. Um, at McQuitty Elementary, we partner with Life Lab and another food court service member, Emma Cervantes, and we offer garden education to students K through five. And we also, I also get to teach at EA Hall garden and nutrition education to middle schoolers. So next, we'll have Patrick Littleton. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Becca. Uh, yeah, so this is the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, and really excited about it. We've had it for almost seven years now, and it serves 12 elementary school sites. Uh, we serve five days of the week, and that's kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, we, our main distributor is uh, the Fruit Guys out of San, South San Francisco. They just, uh, the Fruit Guys out of South San Francisco they distribute um, cut and whole fruit. So it's, it's, in terms of logistics, it's really efficient for our staff to be able to serve that fruit during that morning recess. We start with the, col the cut fruit in the beginning of the week and serve the whole fruit towards the end of the week. Um, we focus on nutrition education during those serving times. So some of the things that we focus on are eating a rainbow, which connects certain colors of fruits and vegetables to specific health benefits. Um, you can see that the 12 FFVP school sites, including Amesti, Ansoldo, Calabasas, Freedom, H.A. Hyde, Hall, Landmark, McQuitty, Minty White, Ohlone, Radcliffe, 
and Starlight. Um, another, <laughs> Linda mentioned that I wear a few different hats through the school district, and um, my other hat that I wear is uh, with the Extended Learning Program. Um, a program of that is Fitness for Life, and Fitness for Life serves 19 after-school sites, and we teach swimming, biking, nutrition, and physical fitness. Um, we also have built school gardens at Starlight, H.A. Hyde, McQuitty, and Hall District Schools. Um, these school gardens uh, function in many different ways for Food Corps members, for Life Lab, and for after school to be able to utilize these school gardens um, for, of course, reinforcing nutrition education, but also for reinforcing science-based nutrition education um, uh, district-wide. Well, at least for the, the, the school sites that have the school gardens. Um, we also have high school youth wellness leaders that are um, provided a stipend for being able to help out in the after-school garden programs. Um, we also have formulated um, multiple community partnerships, um, including Second Harvest Food Bank, Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust, YMCA, Life Lab, and Mariposas Art. Um, I'd like to focus on our partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank, as they are a vital resource for being able to provide um, over 180,000 pounds of fruits and vegetables uh, per year. Um, this is a, an, a great partnership because it, uh, the, the, the produce is delivered for free. So for example, at Chavez Middle School, on Tuesday afternoons, um, the food bank drops a pallet of fresh fruits and vegetables. Most of them are organic and locally grown. Um, this is free of charge. We then utilize that produce in multiple ways. Students cook with it in the after-school garden programs, and they also um, are able to take it home and share with their families. So at each of these school garden sites, um, students have had experience with cooking various fruits and vegetables, but of course, um, they're able to participate and take that home at the end of the after-school program. Thank you. Next, we have John Fisher from Life Lab. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Fisher. I work with Life Lab. We're a community-based organization that was founded 39 years ago at Green Acres Elementary School in Live Oak District. Um, we focus on hands-on education programs for four-year-olds through 14-year-olds. We train about 1,200 educators from across the country, and we run a national network of school garden support organizations. We partner with PVUSD to support the wellness or the proposed wellness policy um, under the track of garden education and nutrition education. And the way we do that is we're partnering with five schools. So we're at Hall District, McQuitty, and Soldo, Amesti, and Starlight. We teach K2 NGSS science with our AmeriCorps staff. Some are Food Corps and some are Notre Dame volunteers here that are based in Watsonville. Um, and we serve 1,200 kids a week during the high season in the fall and the spring. We also partner with local colleges and universities to create a garden crew where on Wednesdays we come and bring these college students to maintain some of these garden sites that we're teaching in during the school day. Um, we maintain a field trip site called the Blooming Classroom. It's a retired flower farmer off of, a mess, or off of San Andreas Road in Watsonville. Uh, this year we brought out 33 field trips. Uh, we partner with the Extended Learning Program to do after school field trips and we also do one school day field trip per week. Um, at all of our field trips, we engage in science education and nutrition education. And one of our um, indicators of success is that 50% of our students have been trying fruits and vegetables that were new to them. And 74% of those students liked or loved what they were tasting. Um, we also run a kids cook program at those five partner elementary schools with third through fifth graders during the winter months where we go into the classroom with a mobile cooking cart and we teach nutrition education and cooking. So we're teaching life skills, we're providing a positive environment for kids to try fruits and vegetables. Um, this year we focused on the theme of eating diversity of um, foods and creating a colorful menu, uh, similar in reinforcing what happens in the ELP and after school uh, programs. Uh, this year in our Kids Cook program, 
we served or we taught 1,500 students. And once again, our indicator was that new and I liked or loved it. 60% of the kids that we came in and cooked with, they were trying those fruits and vegetables for the first time. And 71% of those students said they liked or loved what they eat. Um, on top of all that, last year with our food course service member, um, Emma Cervantes, we piloted a family wellness night at McQuitty School where we were doing yoga, um, introducing a new app for early childhood education, and um, having kids cook and eat fruits and vegetables. So uh, in summary, I just want to say that research um, does say that garden-based learning um, increases academic success, school pride, physical activity, and it supports social emotional wellness um, among students. So we're a great, um, gr grateful to be partnering with the school district. Um, I also want to let it be known that um, the majority of the elementary schools in our county have paid garden educators. Um, our district, we have paid garden educators in our after school programs, but we're working through our Pajaro Valley initiative to look for more garden-based education opportunities during the school day in schools that are interested in it. Continue to serve through our field trip programs at the Blooming Classroom site and find a way to sustain this long term. Thank you. No. So uh, moving um, to school health and safety, uh, we have uh, April Alamon uh, representing the school nurses tonight. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman uh, DeRose, Board Superintendent. Uh, thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Um, I wanted to start with by, um, I put up a picture of the model of a uh, wellness committee. The wellness committee is actually a coordinated school health team that is made up of multidisciplinary um, employees within the district. Uh, you have a representation of health promotion, which would be a health educator, physical education, health, um, health education, uh, health services, which would be the school nurses, nutrition services, uh, healthy school environments. Um, and one of the main health issues within our district is pesticide exposure. And so that would be an example of looking at healthy school environments. Um, student, uh, having representatives who are students, especially those that are interested in potential um, health careers or careers within the overall field of wellness. Um, we have family and community, so you have parents as well as community members, um, counseling, psychological, and special ed, and then health promotion for staff, which is usually represented by um, an administrator. And um, so, uh, how do, where is it? Um, and so, what does a wellness committee do? It meets regularly and um, is continuously assessing the strengths and weaknesses of the district policies and programs for promoting wellness. And so taking a look at um, what's happening and there are um, the Center for Disease Control, which is the public health entity for um, the federal government, as you know, um, has an assessment tool designed for schools that um, can look at each one of the different areas. And then, of course, the Wellness Committee would develop action plans and implement the plans, and then the assessment begins again of how well things are working. Um, and the good news is that recently the district um, has formed a relationship with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation and has received funding from the Kaiser Foundation grant, which um, part of what they're going to do is work with the Wellness Committee um, to implement these processes. So we're excited. Uh, tomorrow we have a meeting with the principals to um, begin that process. In addition, besides having a wellness committee at district level, eventually um, through this program, we hope to have one at the participating school sites where employees at that school site who represent the district area work on things specific, um, on issues specific to the school sites. And that would include the school nurse assigned to that. And so um, looking specifically at what health services the school nurses would do on the wellness committee, basically there are three main roles. The first one being wellness promotion. We know that healthy students are 
uh, better learners overall. Um, they attend school, and so one of the things that school nurses look at is absenteeism. Why are students absent, and is there some sort of health-related um, incident or condition going on. Um, we look at infection control programs. Uh, what can we do? I have a, a program at Duncan Holbert. What can we do to keep kids from getting sick? And then providing health education to um, students, family, and staff as needed. Um, the second thing that the nurses do is provide acute care. And that includes all the medication management and administration. It's usually administered by the health um, assistance, but the nurses oversee it. First aid and CPR training and supplies. Screenings, we do vision, hearing, and immunization screenings. Uh, emergency care, which is all the EpiPen seizures, asthma, et cetera. All the 911 issues, we do care plans and training and provide care to try and avoid calling the 911 and having a panic at the school site. Um, however, if that happens, we're there to provide care. Okay, next slide. And finally, care coordination. Uh, we manage the chronic disease. How can we help children who have chronic illness or who are medically fragile to be at their optimum state of wellness so they can come to school <clears throat> and learn? Um, we are the inter, um, the facilitators of the family, medical provider, and school collaboration. Getting each one of those different systems to work together so that the child can be well. Uh, we oversee medical procedures done at school. Uh, there are a lot of things that take place every day. And then we do all the health assessments uh, for special education and participate in the IEP process. Um, so that uh, gives you an example of how the school nurse, what we do in our job, and then we bring that to the wellness committee. So if the wellness committee was looking at absenteeism through all these different lenses, uh, that's an example of what the school nurse would contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. We have Angela De Novella and Erica Padilla Chavez. Hello, my name is Angela De Novella, and yes, I'll be speaking on behalf of PPPSA. Erica's sitting on the back. Um, yes, we are um, PPPSA, and for uh, 27 years, we've been working in this community, improving the quality of life of students and um, and residents of Pajaro Valley. Uh, we provide health education, counseling, and prevention services, and of course, we're always involved in the advocacy and on the policy aspect of also the well-being of the community. Um, I'll tell you very briefly, uh, on the snapshot, the things that we do. We, um, we provide services to staff of the school district. We provide education, um, in different topics. Recently, we provided um, a presentation on early, early um, identifiers of mental health symptoms on youth. Um, we provide other trainings related to trauma and, and also identifying yeah, early symptoms. Um, and we provide special presentations as requested. Usually, um, staff and teachers of different schools and administrators approaches with different concerns or things that might be benefit the, the community, especially parents, um, and we go and, and, and arrange those presentations. In terms of services to children and families, um, we provide counseling services at most of the schools in the school district um, and provide substance abuse also on site, but we also have our community counseling services and we are able to arrange meetings with parents later on in, in the evening when they might be coming out of work. So we have that flexibility to bring them into, into our counseling services, but we have counselors present at all schools within the school district. Um, we also provide education, mainly uh, around tobacco and substance. We have a curriculum and an evidence-based curriculum on skill building and in most of the schools of the school district. Uh, we work directly with 
student services and provide suspension and expulsion prevention services through our Valor team. And we provide also conflict resolution, crisis support. We have clinicians and staff, at, again, at all the school sites who are there to handle crisis at, at any point during, during the school day. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have parent education. In terms of collaboration, um, of course, we can't do this alone. We work directly with, as I said, with administrators and teachers, um, nurses at different schools who receive um, all our, most of our referrals through any of those venues. And of course, within our HIPAA compliance, we're able to share some, some of that information and work together to provide the best care we can with, for these kids. Um, we are an active member of the Coordinator School Health Committee, and we are members, of course, throughout different um, committees in the, in the community. Um, what else? Yes, we, we have, we partner together with the school district in, in developing programs and, and work together in, in grant development, and, and as I said before, we provide, I um, mean, we share information through through our school district to, again, provide the best care for these kids. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. I'll stick around for any questions. Mm. Um, see if we have any speakers from Salud Para la Gente here. Hi, my name is Michelle DeAnda, and I'm the clinic manager for Salud Para la Gente for our school-based health clinics. Currently, we have clinics at Starlight, PV High, Cesar Chavez Middle School, and Pajaro Middle School. Those clinics, we offer medical and dental services. We also provide screens to the migrant students in the district for vision and oral. And we also are at the Kinder Roundups providing oral and height and weight screenings. Um, I did have a little packet that I can hand to each of you that has a little more details about numbers and how many students we saw last year for physicals, vaccines, and those things. I'll hand those over. I'm not sure how they would get up there. Um, <laughs> um, I did want to mention that we also have a fit and healthy in the after school program at Pajaro Middle School where we help health educators that are teaching students how to prepare healthy snacks. Not only that, stress management and how that can affect your sleep and weight gain and nutrition as well. We have had Zumba instructors and yoga instructors go out there with the children. Um, this will be our third year doing that there and it's been very successful. Um, we also, in our clinics, are um, co-located with Healthy Start, which helps because they're able to do handoffs for referrals for children that come in and see them that may need dental or medical services. And also in two of our clinics, we are co-located with PVPSA. So when a student comes in or a patient in our circumstances, we are able to do a warm handoff at that moment as well. If you have any questions, I will stay for any questions after. Thank you. Uh, so lastly, uh, next steps, um, we're uh, here to answer any questions and looking forward to um, you know, any input on um, the revisions for the approval of the wellness policy. Um, the, you know, a lot of the language like we discussed on May 9th was uh, surrounding um, f uh, new rules, uh, new federal and state rules that needed to, put into, to be put into the document, um, and then a little bit more uh, general general, um, I guess, language to acknowledge the different services that we offer. So that was the um, basic um, revisions that went in. Um, next step definitely is implementation of all of the new rules, and I'll be doing my best to assist the schools with understanding what those new regulations are, um, especially pertaining to fundraising. It's probably where a lot of the questions lie, so um, I'll be working a lot with um, helping the school schools um, get through, um, continue to be able to fundraise, but still be following all the new uh, federal and state guidelines. And um, ongoing is that it's required that we have an assessment of how our district is doing um, done every three years. So um, that's what we'll be working on as well. So implementation and assessment. Um, I did want to apologize for one thing. I noticed that on this 
the document that was attached for the board docs today, it, it's, a, it's not the one that was from May 9th. It should be the same as the one from May, May 9th. So um, I'm not sure how, how we can uh, fix that. But the, <coughs> when we brought it last time, that was the final one to go to the board. And then the one uh, attached to the, the agenda for tonight is a, is a little bit earlier draft. So um, we'll get that fixed. So if there's any questions, we can assist with the answers with our group. Um, no speakers. Any, no speakers, okay. Board questions, comments? Aaron. Aaron. I just wanna say I love Salud para la Gente. I am so glad, <laughs> you know, as a community group, they work with our schools. I, I think they're a wonderful Community organization, and I was almost one of the founders of it. I started working in migrant camps with um, a doctor, and anyways, we ended up starting the clinic. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to ask a question of just some of the stuff that I was reading. Um, you know, I read all the information that you gave us in our board packet, and <laughs> this is one of the places I said, Food and Nutrition Services will use smarter lunchrooms movement tools and strategies to encourage healthy eating for students? Correct. That, that was required language we needed to add into the wellness policy. Uh, smarter lunchrooms is a, um, a program uh, that was I think I believe it was studied. It was started at Cornell University, and it's a, using a lot of um, uh, strategies to help guide students when they come to the cafeteria to make healthy choices. So there's a lot of resources and tools um, that um, student nutrition um, departments are given from them. There's a um, who are given. Uh, that like my department, uh, school nutrition. Okay. Um, so we're provided information from smarter lunchrooms. There's a lot of resources, um, and there's checklists, so that you can go and assess your kitchen. Um, there's a lot of things. I think we probably see that in uh, grocery stores and other places where it, you know, basically how do you highlight your food? That when you highlight your food in a different, in a certain ways, that kids make. <laughs> that actually people make different choices based on how you present food. So if you make a small amount of vegetables and you hide it in the back, most likely they don't, they, they're less likely to take it. Um, and so if you, if you do certain things um, and think about it from the student perspective, so the environment should be inviting, the cafeteria should be you know, well lit, it should look inviting, it should be clean, um, and uh, that healthy food item should be highlighted and be plentiful, and there's a lot of different strategies to help guide students make healthy choices. So that's, that's just um, a resource that's out there, and it was required that we needed to add language into the wellness policy that smarter lunchrooms strategies are used um, to. And they are used. You're yes. using mm -hmm. them. Yeah, we work with smarter lunchrooms. Um, I've attended several trainings. We've done the checklist, um, and last year we applied for and received a grant at two school sites where um, where we were implementing those those strategies. Thank you. So uh, no, I'm glad that we do all the, th I'm glad for our school nurses, I'm glad for the Life Lab, I'm glad for the, what's the other program? I'm glad for all the, pr oh, the Food Corps. I'm glad for all the programs that we're utilizing in our school district to make th things healthier for students, to help students eat healthy food and get physical activity and all those kinds of things. I'm so grateful for all the programs that we work with. Thank you. Maria? Um. Yeah, so thank you everyone who stayed this late uh, to pitch in, in the presentation. I really enjoyed hearing from everyone. I didn't realize we were doing so much, um, so I really enjoyed the presentation. I did have some questions. So for the programs offered, such as Fitness for Life, um, it's only available on certain school sites. So um, specifically the, the after-school program. So if other students from other sites within the district were interested in participating in the program, would they be able to, or is it just site specific? Um, it's site specific based on the after school coordinators that sign up for those programs. Okay. 
So even if we were able to provide transportation, it would still not be available. Well, so for example, the, the, the sites that sign up for those programs, transportation is provided to Watsonville High School from those uh, partner sites. Okay. Students are bused there after school. They participate in swimming and nutrition programs there, and then they're bused back. So there's no possibility that it would be opened to other students? I'm, I'm just yeah. wondering yeah. how, you know. Ba based on availability within the, that after school program, definitely. Okay. Oh, program court. Yep. Great. Thank you. And then as far as the policy piece, under, on page three, under nutrition guidelines for foods available at schools, on paragraph three, <clears throat> it says to maximize student utilization of these programs and ensure that no student goes hungry, the district will explore available USDA waivers allowing the feeding of all children for free and for free and apply for these waivers if the percentage of free and reduced qualifying students makes the program cost effective. So it was my understanding that um, I think the board approved and did without uh, without having to charge any students who were um, had to pay at least a portion out of pocket. Um, so to me, this is concerning because it's based on the number of waivers. Is that am I understanding that? Um, no, I think it's just saying that um, whenever um, there's um, a a program available that we're going to try to bring f free meals or to a school whenever possible. So that's um, the community eligibility provision that I spoke about. So 18 of our schools, I applied for that. Um, it can last up to four years and I can renew. And so those 18 schools currently receive breakfast and lunch at no cost to every single student. Whether they take advantage of it and come in the cafeteria or not is available to them. And we're going to be um, growing that as, student, uh, as the schools um, have the numbers to qualify. And so that's just like a promise that whenever we can qualify and be able to run the program, um, for it to be cost effective, we will apply for that benefit for families. Yeah, I'm just, um, I would hate to turn a student away from a school that's not qualifying within this waiver program um, who doesn't have access to, you know, free or reduced lunch. Um, so Could currently, you repeat the concern? I'm sorry. I yeah, so understand. for schools who who have not qualified as mm -hmm. part of this waiver process, um, students who let's say get in line during lunchtime, are they turned away if they, kind of, if they oh. don't have money to pay for, no. for so, lunch? So without applying for a provision, then every family, every household can fill an application and get qualified for either a reduced fee or, or uh, free meals. And, so, and then in our district for anyone, any family um, qualifying for reduced um, meals, we actually, we waive that fee and we cover it. So basically only families that do not qualify in our district would not be, Got would it. not be um, assisted in that way. So that's um, without any provisions, if we didn't apply, for, if I didn't apply for any, then every single household is, of, you know, is able to apply through the application process and get qualified. Um, so on top of that, we have these uh, universal programs that we're able to apply for. So 18 schools don't even need to worry about that because we're able to qualify them automatically. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Sorry, my microphone wasn't working. Um, you know, as a parent of kids that have come through the district, um, I'm very pleased to see the professionalization of, of the roles in leadership. This is an awesome presentation compared to presentations I've seen in the past. Um, your, your wellness groups are well represented. I'm very impressed with um, Allison Alaman. Are you new to our district, Allison? Or April, sorry. Um, April. Third year, great. Well, anyway, um, with all the representation that's here tonight, it's really great. One of the first things I did as a parent before I was even on the board is I came and addressed the board, and I was very upset because all of the food choices on the school menus were every single day was a fast food item. And whether it was healthier or not, it was teaching our kids that they should be eating fast food every single day. And so, so um, 
So anyway, I just want to say congratulations. I know one of the things that was changed on this wellness policy is the ability for parents to still do um, occasional treats in the classroom, which was a big problem in the original document where it said they could not do that anymore and it caused a lot of unhappy parents um, on campuses. So I appreciate the rewording. Um, and I want to thank John Fisher for his work and, um, and school gardens. My kids came through the Valencia program and um, did weekly field trips up to UCSC and participated. And we thank UCSC for their participation um, with our district. I'd like to see that program, again, expanded to the schools that, that they're not at because only a, a few campuses seem to be getting the benefit. So anyway, thank you, everybody, for being here. Good job. Willie or Georgia, do you have any comments? Pardon me? Do you have any comments? Am I up? No. Thank you. <laughs> what what is the what is the count? Um, how many lunches a day do you do you um, prepare? Uh, on average, we're f we're preparing twenty thousand meals per day, um, and that's between breakfast, lunch. Twenty five what? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand, yeah. and a we day? have a staff about of about one hundred in our department. I I uh, want to. I um, want to just bring this out because I haven't heard one criticism all year out of out of the thousands of youngsters that we serve. Uh, usually, there's you know people upset about something, but I haven't heard one one comment out of twenty thousand lunches a day. Uh, so I find that really uh, wonderful, remarkable. Um, my uh, next comment is kind of sounds silly, but Joe and I will volunteer to be on the lunch committee to go and uh, sample lunches every day. Uh, Joe, I've been trying to find the perfect French fry for the last 15 years, and 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 I think it's my responsibility to do that. The other the other thing I want to add is that the the um, the work that I am up to every afternoon is in the medical insurance area. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to marry a health plan with wellness because we, we know that if we can keep people healthy, they will not have a claim, medical claim, and the rates should either stabilize or head down. Our health insurance for our people within the school district, 40 million a year, and if it goes up 6%, that's $2.4 million a year, that thing's gonna go up. In 12 years, that 40 million is gonna to double to $80 million. We won't be able to afford it. So we have to look at wellness plans for everybody, not only for the children, but for, for all of the staff people so that we can eliminate or reduce medical uh, uh, you know, costs for everybody, which is going to help us financially and maybe put that money back onto the salary schedule. So anyway, uh, you, know, you guys have done a great job. This is the start of the uh, program that I can see, but we need to now move it to the faculty, move it to the staff people. Thank you very much for bringing it up. So, Willie, are you asking that to be added to this policy or think about moving in that direction in the future? I, well, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, think that we, we have to give direction, but I, but I think that it's something that we can look at. Actually, um, I just want to provide an update. We are meeting with our uh, health plan carriers uh, just to review our wellness programs uh, that are offered currently through our, um, our carriers. And one of the other items that we're also looking at is, um, as a health, uh, healthy uh, workforce, is looking at um, gym uh, membership and partnerships within that here in the community and with our district. Um, so that's another area that we're looking at right now. Okay, and Michelle has something to add to. So um, April mentioned it um, for uh, briefly, but um, we are very fortunate because the Kaiser Foundation has sponsored us or supported us to be part of the alliance, the health 
the Alliance for Healthier Tomorrows. Um, and so part of that is we found a big gap or a big need to support staff wellness. Um, so that, that will be a significant part of the work that we're doing because we agree with you that um, that is one area in which we're very weak. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, also to um, address your question, in the new language added to the wellness policy, um, under family, community, and staff involvement, section B, it says health promotions for staff, and it talks about the district shall promote opportunities for staff members to participate in health promotion programs. Uh, when feasible, the district will offer professional development opportunities and resources for staff to increase knowledge and skills about promoting healthy behaviors in the classroom and in school. So. There's, right. there's some some language that addresses health promotions for staff as well. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Acosta, do you have any questions? Okay, um, I have um, a couple. Um, so you mentioned that the document that we have isn't the updated one. Yeah. So um, on May 9th, the we brought this then um, for discussion, and then the attachment was the correct one. And I noticed that the one um, attached for this one uh, is has just some slight differences. So okay. um, I'm not sure how we can get that so, updated. So um, will we be able to update that like within a couple of days? So. Um, we have the two weeks so so we will get that and it'll be it'll be posted publicly as well right okay um so that way we can review it and forward any questions to joe and cc michelle um so this one you may have been updated but um right above where you were just reading the family community and staff involvement page 10 um item d health and safe school environment, and then there's a question mark. Right, that's why, yes, yeah. That's, so I noticed when it was, I could see the highlight and the question mark that it so was that's earlier. that's yes. triggered the, okay. Yeah, so okay. even going back to, in board docs, going to look at the May 9th, um, I see the agenda item on there, and the attachment, it has the, the new language. Oh, okay, and then um, I don't know who can, who can answer this question, either Michelle or Joe. Do we have a separate policy that addresses bullying, or would that be in this? Because I did a control find, and I couldn't find the word anywhere in this document. Um, I'm sure that I would have to look it up. I'm sure it's under student services that we have it, and it's under, I know that we have a policy on cyberbullying, for sure, because we're updating that one currently. Um, so I'm sure that we have one um, in terms of bullying under student discipline. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't probably be under the wellness policy, but it would be under student discipline. It seems to me like wellness, the wellness policy, I mean, if we have it, it's fine. I guess it doesn't matter, but um, it is talking about counseling, psychological, and social services, and social um, emotional, yeah. so that's just something that hopefully well, we, we can, can bring forward. Sure, so. we can add. Okay, and then um, the changes in the fundraisers, um, state and federal regulations have changed, you mentioned, um, so I feel like it's really important to communicate that out to school sites and families on why we have to make those changes. It's not just a, the board decided that we yeah. have to adhere. Oh, no. right. mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important because it can seem like we're just implementing things Willy-nilly. <laughs> I wasn't going to use that, but go ahead. That's, no, and, go. and the first time that um, <coughs> this was um, brought to principals, um, there was trainings um, and uh, group meetings with principals with handouts and explanation at that time um, and with my previous director and then um, I'm looking to do whatever it takes to um, help explain that um, this time around. Okay. I just want one more okay. thing. Real quick because we're getting... Oh, I just want to, one more thing. Um, I, I would think you would be... I would, I would imagine we'd be promoting, I know it's not totally wellness, but it's sort of well, uh, things like recycling, and um, I don't know if you actually do composting, because you know, we talk about all the people from different community life labs, all this fitness for life, um, promoting sort of composting kind of ideas, recycling, composting, I would think you'd be doing that too. 
Yeah, I, I thought about including that in my presentation as well. Just a, it's a personal interest of mine. Um, it's never addressed in any of the rules and regulations pertaining to school nutrition, but um, I, know, I know our area and I get a lot of phone calls and questions about it. So um, I've worked with a few schools that have uh, worked with Monterey Bay Aquarium and have a campaign against sport packets. Um, so we've done things to kind of um, provide them a you know, dispenser and not have the, um, not have the packages that they've talked about. So work with the few schools that um, really have this green team going on and try to address their concerns. Um, and, and, package, and food waste and packaging waste is something we've worked with. There was an outside group that came in um, last month and worked with us and did some uh, analysis at some schools during mealtime. And so we're, that's just something personally we're looking at just to make sure that food waste and packaging waste is at a minimum um, while still meeting all of our um, our regulations. So in general, there's a lot of packaging because of the types of kitchens that we have. Um, a lot of satelliting happens and so everything needs to be covered. So there's a little bit of that, but we explain that and we do our best. It's not something that we've put into the wellness policy though. Okay, so um, this, I'm, I'm sorry, did you have something else, Joe? No, I was just gonna say in closing, I, um, on behalf of the team, we thank the, the board for the opportunity and your support. And I'd just like to give a round of applause to the team because they're definitely moving this forward. Thank you very much. And um, thank you all for coming. I, it was nice to see a good representation of um, what's happening at our schools. So um, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the first reading of our board policy 5030. Um, wellness policy first reading. Make a motion to approve the first reading of the wellness policy. I'll second that motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes 601. Um, item 12.5. This is um, a request for approval on Alianza Charter School Measure L bond project reprioritization. <laughs> so before we continue, I do want to uh, make a motion to extend the meeting to 11 p.m. Okay, and um, yes, because we do have some action items that Second. we have to take. So um, all those in favor of extending the meeting to 11 o'clock? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, Mo motion passes 511. And okay, and this is Victor Sandoval is giving this uh, presentation. Hi, Victor. Thanks for waiting. Good evening, uh, Board President DeRose, Board members, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. Tonight, um, the Planning Department is recommending the approval of 12.5, the reprioritization of projects. The reason for this recommendation is that uh, recently we had a site inspection by Cal OSHA. And the inspector of Cal OSHA identified several items that were addressed immediately. And in addition, three more projects that are quite sizable in scope and dollar value. So tonight, because of that, we want to exercise one of the procedures that was uh, previously approved late last year, the reprioritization. Um, it was co-authored by our bond oversight chair and myself for this particular reason. Um, what we want to do is take the remaining funds from the Measure L, or what's remaining from the allocation to Alianza, and address these three issues. I've been guaranteed by our CBO that we're going to be able to cover them. However, <coughs> we're going to have to use several uh, other budgets, and uh, hopefully that we can cover these and get these get these addressed prior to any other issues coming up. So tonight, um, I'm recommending that you guys approve this motion so that we can go forward with it. Okay, and we do have a speaker. We do, Bill Beecher. <coughs>
Good evening. Uh, the good news is we created a process and it worked. But like everything that's new is you usually learn something from doing it. And, uh, and I think we've learned something and I'll comment at the end um, some of those things that we need to do a little differently, not with this process, but with our sites. So <clears throat> it turns out that uh, at a previous meeting and also at the COC meeting in February, we had Alianza site council and parents that came in and complained about issues at their site. So prodding from trustee uh, your hero, uh, he forced Mark and I to have to go out to Alianza. And so we did a review uh, with the principal and, uh, and I'll share with you some of the things that we saw while we were there. Well, in order to get to the Alianza con uh, campus, there was no parking. So we had to go over to the Charter School uh, of the Arts to park, problem number one. But we were able to look at both campuses and truthfully, they just don't look as good as our other campuses. That brings up a question that I'll talk about at the end. So at Alianza, here were the things that we saw uh, that fit into what Victor has on his list is the new bathrooms are going in and installed. They weren't all done, but boy, they look nice. There was color coordination with the school colors. They lo it, it looked good. Um, but they brought up that there was a shortage of classrooms, that they had teachers that had to move around and that they don't have office space. They also had a bunch of windows that had been condemned, part of that process that Victor alluded to, and they are scheduled to be replaced. We also saw dry, dry rot up in some of the beams and uh, the traffic issue with buses and cars and the lack of parking is not a minor thing. I mean, I went through this out at Mar Vista where something needs to be done. And then the playground surface was old. Actually, there's two playground surfaces. One was nice, the other one is real old. Most of this stuff has nothing to do with Measure L. And so there was confusion by the principal, and I saw this at Mar Vista and, and at Rio, uh, where the site council and the principal wasn't sure what do you do when you have these kinds of issues that need to be dealt with. And so for me, I looked at that and I said, gee, there's training that's missing. And I saw this when we first implemented and why we did the process thing last year is these site councils and the principals don't understand what all the options are and what they can do or should be doing. Uh, Secondly, uh, in going by the Charter School of the Arts, their roofs are about as old as I am, and that's not good. They look terrible. Not only that, but just the, the, the charter school just looks dingy. Don't know what we can do about that, but it falls in that there's nothing in Measure L that could help them out. So. What I've done is to do an area map showing where some of the problems were. We saw dry rot in the circle on the right, and we saw the old playground was on the circle on the left. Now I have a, a thought was that they have a security problem. They have a low fence that runs along that side road that's only about two foot high and people come along and they grab children and pull them over and and so the principal's worried that people may take children away they could abscond with them because it's too easy to get to the children well if we were to put fencing along there and either created parking for cars or for buses you improve the situation immediately but they also have a fairly large area in the front where you could do parking and you go but it was never identified in Measure L. Sorry about that. And then with uh, the Charter School of the Arts is that the, the red circle area is those roofs, if you went out there and looked at them, you kind of go, oh my God, uh, waiting for a disaster. 
So uh, how do we have uh, equity with our charter schools and the rest of our district? Now, how do they fall into our whole facilities planning? And that kind of leads into what's missing. We're eight years into um, Measure L in the planning, the facilities committee. I was on that facilities committee. Well, we need a facilities committee now that's out there looking at these buildings, identifying these problems that we hear by people coming to us. We need an active facilities committee. And that closes what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Are there comments or questions from the board? Willie, I see your go right ahead. Hey, okay. Victor, the um, the uh, priorities at um, Alianza need to get changed, and that's why you brought this tonight, correct? Well, they have OSHA violations. Uh, it's kind of twofold. Let him answer, please. It's kind of twofold. Um, they only have very little money left to address the two projects that we have at hand. Um, we need to really just kind of focus on those two items solely because they're fire life safety. Right. Uh, one is the fire alarm, and the other one is a clock bell paging system, so the all call. So we need to salvage whatever is left and focus on those two projects. Yeah, you know, you, you know, to add to what what uh, Bill said, uh, I I went out there expecting far less maintenance and uh, things which um, you guys have already done. There, there's a, there's a uh, wing out there that's uh, brand new. There are uh, bathrooms. Matter of fact, when I first walked walked out there, I said porta potties for our kids. Porta potties? No, that's never going to happen. But what I what I found out was th uh, was that when the uh, bathrooms modernization catches up and is finished, those uh, porta potties are going to be gone immediately. Every everyone there is get those out of here. So. Anyway, there, uh, my uh, comment is that I was, I was pleased to see so much work being done. Um, Alianza is the old South Sepueti school, and it's very, very old. And so everything out there needs to get done, I think. And so anyway, I, it's um, being worked on. And so I'd I like to make the motion to um, approve the uh, uh, request here. I'll take a second, and then we can continue with discussion if there's more. I'll second. Okay. Any more discussion or comments? Okay. I have a – I'm sorry. Um, in – on the document under process, um, it says – it's talking about when the school plan was established, there were priorities set. Um, and it had to include um, parents' notification of the community. Does, is that being done with the revision as well? No. And in what um, ways? What, what the document says, or the, the approved document, which is attached, it's uh, under 12.1. I'm talking about 12.4. 12.4, no, it doesn't take place. Uh, what, what happens is because of the severity of the issues that were identified by Cal OSHA. We're exercising just 12.1, which the board says, because of fire and life safety, we're making the motion on reprioritization of, the, of their um, priority list. Okay. All right, I see that. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay. So I will go ahead and uh, we have a motion, motion and a second. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So student safety is one of the most important things that we have to keep on top of. So thank you. Um, no report and discussion items onto the consent agenda. <coughs> um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve? I, I just want to pull a couple things. 
from the carcinogen. Do I do that now? <laughs> yes, you tell me what numbers those are. Okay, I wanted to pull 14.3, um, and 14, thir yeah, 14.3, yeah. Point three. No, no, no. Um, Leslie, oh, I'm sorry. Just a moment. The one about agile minds, what is, it? what's that one? 14 point, oh, they're 14, 14 point 13. 14.13. Okay. And, and then the last one is maybe I just want a little bit more information on the 14.16. Service agreement. Analytic schools. Okay. Okay. Do you want to make a, a motion with those pulled? So I'm making a motion to pass everything with the two, with discussion of the, the two, two deferred Wait, items. We don't want to before you make the motion okay what I like to do is just um, I don't want to pull it I just want to want to make a comment for the record item uh, for 14.26 I believe is the EA Hall EA Hall field and I just want to thank uh, Victor uh, and um, um, Michelle for everyone and also for the uh, people on the board I thank you guys very much for supporting this uh, it uh, means a lot to uh, EA Hall School and to to the Watsonville area and it is we have we've we've all worked on this for a long time so thank you very much okay, okay is there a second we have a motion by Karen I'll second okay all those in favor Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion, motion passes 601. The second was Kim. So, uh, so deferred consent items, we'll start with 14.13. So and what were your questions? Is there here? I forgot, I forgot who was the one. So either Susan or I can speak to it. Okay, I'll speak that, to it first. Um, okay, so Agile Mind um, is unique in that um, it pairs, it couples math instruction with basically providing students with social emotional support simultaneously. So for example, one thing that it, it, it promotes is what's called effective effort. So it's helping students to realize how they can, the effort that they are applying, is it being effective or not? So for example, if we have a test on Friday, do we wait until the night before to cram and do all of it? Or do we actually <laughs> to systematically look at chunking it? Um, so that we can apply the best effective effort. It also works on goal setting and it works on persistence and self-efficacy, meaning believing that what I do actually supports um, the work. The difference between Agile Mind and other things that I appreciate is that it doesn't do it in isolation. So meaning if I try to tell you, well, apply effective effort and we just do it abstractly, then it doesn't help you versus if I apply pressure to you and then I'm helping you simultaneously to apply effective effort, you learn it, right? Not just conceptually, but actually you um, literally learn it. So it's, um, it has proven to have a lot of support in accelerating math. So this is going to be, it was used this year for the first time. It's now going to be used in two different places, both with our Math 1 teachers and with our brand new pilot with um, Summer in the City. So the Summer in the City internship program is also going to be using Agile Mind as well with our teachers that are teaching the curriculum. And again, it's about helping the kids to learn these skills that really make them effective learners and effective adults. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Any other questions? Okay. Karen, do you want to make a motion? I make a motion to approve this. One, 14, 13. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502 with Trustee Acosta absent. I don't know if she left or if she stepped out for a moment. No, she left. <laughs> okay, item 
14.16. This is also a deferred item on the analytic agreement. Analytic schools, yes. Yeah, so. Is that also? Okay. Hey, Helen. Aren't you glad you stayed? <laughs> Love being here this late. Um, President DeRose, board members, um, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this software is what we use for our budget development and our multi-year um, projections. Um, it is very user-friendly for my staff to use and um, provide oh, software. Analytical is software. Analytic, yeah. Analytic. It's, oh. Yeah. It's a software that we use to prepare the budgets for you. Okay, so I, I wasn't sure. It just, just, I was reading what it said about it, and I was like, well, I, I'm not even sure 100% what that is. Yeah. Okay. And we, oh, we have software. this contract every year. Oh, okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Yeah. I move to approve 1416. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502 with Trustee Acosta and Ursino absent. Um, for closed session, we do not need to reconvene, so we'll move to 17 action on closed session. And we had um, one expulsion under item 2.1. Um, Trustee Osmondson, would you? Oh, thank you for telling her that. I forgot to. <laughs> Go ahead. Make sure you got the mic, so. I, I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion of the remainder of 2017-2018 year and the fall semester of 2018-2019. Oh, and this one has with placement and another school outside the district. This is different than most suspensions. Um, for seventeen eighteen zero three nine. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five zero two. And um, the rest of closed session. I'm sorry. So um, under item two point two. 2. I move to approve the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Certificated Report, personnel report as presented by the district administration with um, the addition of six, six administrative appointments, two other assignments, and nine separations. Uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502. I do want to congratulate um, the eight appointments, administrative appointments. Uh, we have Carrie Lerox, um, who is now our CELPA director. She comes from uh, program director, I'm sorry, okay. says CELPA director, so I'm just reading. Wow, um, comes to PUSD from Santa Cruz <laughs> Garden Elementary, where she's a principal with much experience utilizing a student center approach to um, lead her teams. We also have Josh Phillips, uh, who is now our assistant principal at Aptos Junior High, uh, comes to PUSD from Monterey Bay, uh, where he is an assistant principal and a lot of um, and a lot of secondary education experience as an administrator, athletic director, and teacher. We have now Susie Alarcon, child development coordinator. She comes from Hollister with much experience in the public and private sector in family services and CTE. We have um, Laura Smith, now our academic coordinator at Mar Vista. She was promoted from teacher at Radcliffe. Uh, we have Mike Berman, now our director of equity, federal and state programs. Um, he was promoted from Hyatt Elementary, uh, from Hyatt Elementary principal. We have Mayra Fernandez, um, now our principal at Hall District Elementary. She was promoted from academic coordinator we have Rafael Ramirez, who is now our principal at New School. Um, he's bringing expertise, lending his expertise at charter and K-8 programs to alternative ed education. And lastly, we have Andrew Singleton, um, now our interim principal at PCCS, and needs um, 
Uh, he would be bringing his leadership experience to help with the end of the year closing and school opening activities. I do want to highlight that of um, all eight administrative appointments, five of them are in-house. And I think that's uh, very valuable because it shows that as a district, we're trying to build our own. So thank you, Chona, for putting this together for me. Um, and so now under item 2.3. I move to approve the Paro Valley Unified School District Classified Personnel Report as presented by the district administration with the addition of one separation. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 502. All right, and under item 2.7, um, do I have this correct? Give me one second. Um, yeah, under item 2.7, uh, the board approved a workers' compensation claim settlement um, authority claim for number 81060060123 with a 5011 vote. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I was making it without coughing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, item 18, upcoming meetings. Um, there has been um, a change made to the calendar. Um, we have currently a special board study session scheduled for November 28th. That's going to be moved to December 5th. Okay. December 5th? I thought it was the 5th. Okay. When is our uh, reorg meeting? Isn't that the first the 12th. meeting? Oh, the 12th. December twelfth. Okay. So I don't need to do that right now. Okay. Okay. So the next meeting will be the twenty seventh, and we'll we'll be doing our eighteen nineteen budget adoption. So just to remind the board, um, if there are any um, additional comments. Uh, please send them to the superintendent's office within the next, I'd say, week week to 10 days. So um, she has time to respond. Um, and I believe that's it. So um, item 19 is adjournment. Thank you for coming.